been a while. Oh, dude, Nickelback. <laughs> no, you can't do this again. It's stained, goddammit. It's stained without the E. Yes. Anyways, it's been a while. <laughs> it has. It's been a while. It's been... It's, it's been it's, longer for me than for you. Yeah. It's, uh, I think, I think like, mid-May or something. Yeah. Instead of taking a month between episodes, we took two months between episodes. Yeah. Well, you had, like, half a D3 cast at some point. Oh, yeah, that's true. Wait, that was in... Wait, no, E3's not in May. What the fuck am I talking about? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So look forward to whatever technical difficulties arise from this episode. Oh, hell yeah. Hey, you want to talk about technical difficulties? I have an embarrassing Broly story to talk to you about. Okay, so I just want to build this up to where... There was a point where we were in, like, a call, and Rosin was like, you know what, I'm just going to tell this story, and I left. Yeah, he left... I needed... To, to save this. To keep his virgin ears for, for for the podcast. So this better be a good story. Okay. It's gonna probably be better for you than anyone else. So. Okay. Because I know you're just the biggest Broly fit. No. So. Oh, yeah. Um, this is unrelated to the uh, story. The story. The story of Broly coming out next year. I meant to say movie. Um, but yeah, there's a Dragon Ball Super, uh, Broly movie coming out next year, because everyone loves yes. Broly. Uh, Honestly, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, kinda. I think it could be good. I wish it was an original villain, but, like, I feel like that might be one of those things where, other than the design, hey, maybe he might as well be, if they change him enough. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm hoping for. Uh, I'm just excited to see Frieza and Broly duke it out, because that's gonna be dumb. Yeah. And we all know how that's gonna go, where Frieza's gonna be like, wow, he's powerful, and then he's gonna be like, oh no, I was golden for too long, and then it's gonna be like, w wacky hijinks. So, and then I realize now we're just talking about Dragon Ball and such a story, but do you, I think, like, I think this movie is gonna, you never watched Super all the way through, but I did, and I everyone watched, knows. I, I've only seen the future Trunks saga. <laughs> but, like, everyone knows the Tournament of Power spoilers, so I'm not even gonna yeah. bother, but like, I feel like however this movie goes is either going to be the final nail in the coffin to Frieza, like, not being a villain anymore, or it's going to, like, dial that back a bit. Like, if Goku and Frieza team up again in this movie, that's just, like, that, okay. Frieza's Piccolo again. Yeah, Frieza's Piccolo at that point. And then when, <laughs> and then when fucking Dragon Ball Ultra starts, Cell's going to come back. Oh, no, they can't. <laughs> just... And then... See, my favorite thing is in canon, Cell hasn't been seen again, and I want to believe that's because he was an android and not real. <laughs> so, he, like, I want to believe that Cell has no soul as canon. Like, what I what I deep down want is that thirty years from now, uh, like we're just gonna be like, oh yeah, Zamasu's a good guy now. Like, you know, yeah, like yeah. it's just gonna keep going. <laughs> I mean, more villains have become good guys than stayed dead. You know. Yeah, which is hilarious because I feel like we had this conversation that used to be the thing that everyone made fun of Naruto for. And now it's okay. just warp, like now it's just loop back around and like nope, now the now the granddaddy is like that too, which is yeah, hilarious. I mean they it always was. I mean, you know, when you get that like Tien and Yamcha started off as villains. Yeah, that's true. Though like they were never like super evil. They were just always like competitors like piccolo was evil. Uh, yeah piccolo was evil i would say tn was kind of close he was a dick yeah but... he worked for a bad guy yeah 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 yamcha was always kind of like yamcha was a roguish thief he, he was a goober but he was yeah. a good lad deep down anyways that's the dragon <laughs> yeah, okay. Ball okay, okay so now that we've uncovered our dragon ball takes um so uh as uh, as Fathom does, Fathom was like, hey, we're going to have some Fathom events that you can pre-order tickets for. Uh, and they were having two Dragon Ball-related uh, showings. And like Resurrection F, this one is actually available at my local theater. Or both of them are. Uh, so the first one is going to be a screening of the first Broly movie. And I was like, fuck yeah, I need tickets for this. Um, and they also announced what they're calling the Sand Double Feature which is a back-to-back -back screening of Bardock, the father of Goku, and Fusion Reborn. Just uh, just, just so everyone knows, he meant to say Saiyan. 
San. Continue your story. I, I pronounced it right. I don't fucking care what anyone says. Um, whatever. It's also big. Cyogen. This is just how you pronounce it. Um, so yeah, so I ordered tickets for both of those. Not gonna lie, kind was kind of weirded out, because when I first saw, like, oh, double feature, and I saw Bardock, I was like, oh, the other one's gonna be History of Trunks, right? Nope. Um. Yeah, it's a weird choice. Yeah. But, um, you know, whatever, fuck it. It, it. I want a chance to see those in theaters, so I took it. Um, and then, you know, later on, I, uh, I was like, I, I should order tickets for Ant-Man and the Wasp, because, like, it had been out for, like, a week at that point. Um, like, this is just this weekend. So, on my lunch break, I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll order tickets. And I ordered my tickets, and I'm like, okay, time to go see Ant-Man and the Wasp. Now, I don't know how everyone else's movie theaters work, but, like, just recently, we got these things that are just like, hey, swipe in your credit card that you use to pay for your pre-ordered tickets, and it'll just shoot them out. And you just get your tickets really fast and easy. You don't even need to talk to anyone. Just hand your ticket to the ticket person. Oh, yeah, no, that that's not where I go to. It's, uh, it's, it's really, it's really nice and convenient. Yeah. So this is probably my fourth time using this thing. We've had it since, like, probably, like, December. I think, like, literally Last Jedi, I think, was the first time I used it. Um, so, it spits out my Ant-Man, the Wasp ticket, and I go, hell yeah, and then I'm about to leave, and I notice it's printed out something else, and it's my Dragon Ball Z double, double feature ticket i would go oh yeah i i kind of didn't think they'd print them out this early i i better grab this ticket and then make sure that i store this good because like movie tickets aren't built to last man like they'll they'll fade yeah and, and i'm kind of worried about that but i'm like oh well and then it starts to print out my broly ticket and i grab my broly ticket and then it stutters for a bit and then it prints out another broly ticket then it prints out another Broly ticket, <laughs> and another Broly <laughs> ticket, and they're all for, like, seat F9, like, it's just copies of the ticket I ordered, and I'm yeah. like, uh, uh, um, and, like, I'm kind of, like, freaking out that someone from, like, behind, like, notices, and they're like, oh, hold on, and then he goes in the back, and I'm just kind of, like, grabbing these tickets, and, like, they're shooting out onto the floor at this point, <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> and there's, like, a line behind me of people wanting their Ant-Man <laughs> tickets, and I'm like, oh, this is the worst. And I'm scooping up the tickets, and then movie theater girl shows up. Oh god! And then I'm like, oh no! And then she kicks the machine, does whatever. I'm too busy scooping up tickets, and then I'm like, I have a giant pile of Broly tickets in my hand, and I go, Do you need like, can I just toss these? Do you need to shred these? And she's like, No, you can just toss them. And like, she she picks up the remaining tickets, and then she adds them to my pile in my hands as I'm about to walk over, and then she says, So, Broly, huh? <laughs> and I... And, and I just... And I just said, yeah, and I walked away really fast. <laughs> I hate oh my, my life. <laughs> this has been a saga I never asked for. And it's only I MCU mean, movies. Like, I, I don't think anyone listening to this understands. No. <laughs> so... It all starts. Yeah. With, it all starts with Black Panther. Yeah. So, I um, <laughs> I think okay. So I go to get my popcorn as I do for every movie. Uh, on my way into Black Panther, and I've never had like normally I'm not this person and I'm fine with this. I'm just gonna say I don't really know how any other way to word this. The person working at the booth was fairly attractive, and she she says the worst thing possible, which is not, okay, what do you want on your popcorn? She says, oh, you come here a lot, and I don't know what to say back, and I'm a little bit flustered, and I just said, yeah, I love movie theaters, because that was the first <laughs> thing that came to mind, and I was like, oh, that was, oof, that's not great, uh, and then I walked into the Black Panther theater, <laughs> you know, the one theater they have for Black Panther. Yeah, um, I don't know, you live in the boonies. Yeah, you know, it's weird out here. Um, Wisconsin forever. Um, and I immediately go on Discord and I'm like, oh my god, I just had the worst experience. And everyone else is like, it's not that bad. You, I think you're, like, thinking this is worse than it actually was. Um, and then I go to Infinity War. I'm pretty sure it was Infinity War. 
Um, and that person's back. I'm like, oh, I hope this person doesn't... Re I mean, clearly, everyone at that movie theater, I'm pretty sure, knows who I am at this point, just because I go often enough. Like, I'm clearly one of the regulars there. Um, and I'm like, oh, I hope nothing happens. And she goes, hey, you're the guy who loves the movie theaters, right? And I go, yep. I grab my shit and I go into <laughs> Infinity War again. And then this happened, and I'm just mad. <laughs> So broly, huh? So, yeah. And, like, I don't... I didn't... Like, the way that was expressed to me, I don't know if that was, like, a ha-ha or, like, a really... Y you know, like... <laughs> like, I, I couldn't... I couldn't parse out the the reaction there. Maybe she just wanted your hot Dragon Ball take. Like, I, I she wanted don't, to know what you thought. I, I don't think so. She uh, was like, oh, you know, what do you think about Broly at the new Dragon Ball movie? I don't know. That's what happens at my job. Yeah. So yeah, that was the worst. But I felt like I needed to share that because I had an em embarrassing Broly experience in the year of our Lord, 2018. You're gonna end up marrying this girl. <laughs> no! <laughs> I don't want this. <laughs> I hate everything. <laughs> I never want to see that. I didn't want to see that person again in my life after the Black Panther incident. I yeah. Just, like, it just keeps happening. I need to find a different movie theater to go to, but we only have the one. <sighs> yeah. Well, I started a new job, and I, I'm working a big boy job with big boy hours now, so I have no time to do shit anymore, so that's fun. Yeah. 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 Anyways, how have, how have you been? <laughs> <laughs> so that's why that's why this is the last WAF ever. Yeah. Full time employment's a bitch, everyone. Um, my life has been interesting. So I went on a trip. Uh, it's become a yearly trip now, actually, to Tennessee with the and stuff. Yeah, I I hate it, but whatever. Um, so this is gonna be a a a. I told part of this story on Twitter, but now I'm gonna give like the full fleshed out detail. So. My sister, this is this was her first year there. She missed the last two, and um, she's pregnant right now, so there wasn't a lot she could do. Oh, same. Like, not yeah. not me, but my sister. <laughs> yeah, congratulations on your pregnancy, Rosalyn. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm gonna name the child Zach. So like, oof. so we couldn't go out drinking. You know, she couldn't really do a lot of like boating water stuff. Um, so she was a little bored. At one point, she mentioned that she wanted to. Uh, see a cave because because someone someone brought up that there were caves here and this is the general area where like my father and aunt kind of grew up and they remembered as kids there was a really cool they called it the indian cave and uh that's it was, tennessee for you <laughs> yeah yeah they said it was a really cool a really cool cave with a lot of like native american stuff around it but uh they, they remembered exploiting as kids and they liked it but it was like a tourist spot so we went on a trip to try to find it. We tried looking it up and we couldn't find it like on the map. But my dad was like, I, I swear, I, I remember around where it was. So if we just find the general direction, I could get us there. Um, so we drove for like two hours, which by the way, it's a 10 hour trip to get there. None of us wanted to be in a car for two hours, but whatever. Um, we uh, couldn't find it. We eventually found a guy and asked him, and he was like, yeah, it's on the other side of the river. You gotta go around. So, like, by you found a guy, like, were you just out in the wilderness and happened to stumble across a lone hiker? Or, like, are you still in town yet? We're, we're in... So, it it's weird for me, because I'm from New Jersey suburbs, okay, and I don't yeah. really... <laughs> that, that distinguished, like... That probably means a different I, thing for me than you, then. <laughs> yeah, like, I don't really understand, like, mid-middle-of-the-country mid, towns. I, I'll say that... <laughs> sometimes there's just a street with four houses across a mile, and that's kind of town to us sometimes. <laughs> where, where we were out, there was a lot of fields, a lot of occasional shops, and an occasional house. Yeah. Um, and that's very different from what I'm used to. Yeah. And it was, a, it was a while until we saw someone we could ask. So that was, like, the first person we saw. He was just, like, pulling into his driveway. Um, and he told us, yeah, so you got to go around the, the, the river and it's on the other side. So we went around, and we still couldn't find it. And it's not coming up on any Google Maps, no GPS. Um, 
but my dad is convinced we're in the right area. So we decide to walk a little bit down down the down like a trail that we found. And as we're walking, it's completely overgrown. Like absolutely covered in, in ivy, moss, trees, leaves, all that stuff. Now when you say trail, do you mean like a paved ass cement walking, like hiking trail, or is this just like oh someone dirt. cleared out dirt? Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Those are the good ones. Um, but it like, hey, thirty years ago maybe it was something more. Which... Yeah is what I'm getting to, in which as we're walking down this path, um, we find an abandoned, like, uh, attraction area with completely run-down buildings and, like, wagons that are, like, caved in and overgrown. And we didn't even notice the buildings at first because they're just covered in, like, you, you'd be looking at what you think is just a wall of, like, ivy and leaves. And then you turn around a little bit and you notice that there's a building underneath it all. Like, insanely overgrown. More overgrown than I expected to find anything like that in this kind of area. Because other places, like, there's still houses. Like, there are people living around here. But, like, just, like, 15, 20 minutes off the road from there, we found this abandoned area. Um, long story short, we're, we're pretty sure it was the path leading to the cave that he remembered. Um, apparently the cave was shut down years ago Damn. and it just, it just became like vandalized and everything that they built to try to get attractions to get people in there. They just left it all and it just, nature took it over. Cheaper than tearing it all down. <laughs> yeah. Um, but like, Hey, abandoned shit so my aesthetic you know like yeah i'm having more fun looking at this stuff than anything else i've done on the trip so far uh so me and my sister's husband uh got a little adventurous and decided we wanted to go inside we wanted to like carve our way through the through the like plants and ivy and and see what we could find um so we do and it's pretty cool i took some really cool pictures i posted some of them on twitter uh, unfortunately, a lot of the best pictures I didn't want to post because there's people in them. Um, yeah. But there's a few pictures I posted on Twitter. Uh, but the weird part is hanging on a, on a on a hanger above a pile of broken glass was a red dress, and it is a much newer red dress than anything else in that area. Like this, this within the last year was put here uh, with one big dirt stain going down it. And it freaked us all the fuck out. Uh, obviously our mind is rusted through like, are we at a scene of a crime? Is there like what's happening here? And then all of a sudden my aunt who was with us, but didn't go into the building is like, guys, I, I hear something. And then all of a sudden we hear like, stuff rust rushing through the back and then all of us are convinced we start seeing things out of the corner of our eyes um so we get freaked out and we leave and as we leave like cop cars are starting to pull up Oof. <laughs> so we just pass them you know hi here we go <laughs> uh we we make it back to the house and we're all we're all like we had fun exploring but we're a little spooked about the dress. Not, like, scared. Like, we're making jokes about it. But it's a little spooky. Because, like, did something actually happen? Or did someone just get a dress dirty and leave it there, you know? So I do have one possible answer from growing up near a creek where yeah. teenage hoodlums did... St hey, hey, guilty as charged did stupid shit all the time in the middle of the night. Um, yeah. Still... So uh oh no i was just gonna say no, go ahead. okay still remember walking from my friend's place so there's a path leading through here and to get to one of my friend's places growing up back to my house where we're all spending the night um actually no we're spending the night at his place but i was the only one with the copy of risk god damn it so we're all like just walking down this trail at like 1 a.m and i have a giant like box of risk and like, we just hear rustling coming from, like, one of, like, the little, like, clearings in, like, the creek. And we're all like, yeah, fuck this. And we just bolted for it. Um, but also, um, it was not uncommon to find, like, dirty jackets and things that were just strewn about. Because what people would do is, like, take off their clothing and then use it as, like, bedding for fucking. 
Yeah. Hey, I I I I suggested that as like maybe you know someone was getting freaky. Yeah. But uh, the one thing about broken that, glass though kind of makes that yeah, weird. Yeah. Broken glass <laughs> made that weird, especially the fact that it was hanging on a hanger over a bed of broken glass. Yeah. Um, there was the single dirt stain, and it was a nice dress, and it was like an adult size dress. So I don't think they were teenagers, and I don't think that's what they would have used. And I don't yeah. get why they would leave it behind. Next part of the mystery. We're really curious about, like, what kind of dress it was. So we started looking it up. The tag said Estee Lauder. And we discovered that Estee Lauder does not make dresses. Nice. We were all really convinced. We saw the tag. It said Estee Lauder. The only thing we could find is that Estee Lauder has employee uniforms. The only problem with that is that the employee uniforms are blue and this was red. So we could not even remotely find what this dress was. Either it was a Estee Lauder knockoff or like some kind of seasonal employee uniform. I don't know. But it was weird that it was there and we were all freaked out. And then the next day I got extremely sick. Oh no. Very, very sick. And I've been sick for the past like 10 days now i was sick on the ride home i've been sick the entire week i've been back i'm only now starting to get a bit better you might even still be able to hear it in my voice and i might cough during this podcast but as soon as i started getting better uh my back got like my back pain came back my back got thrown out so i'm just convinced that i'm cursed now that i because we disturbed the red dress that i'm haunted at least and, you uh, didn't drink the fluid that was in the black sarcophagus dude that's the best story yeah I love that. <laughs> it, so my thing is, it would have been a haha, but the fact that that fucking change.org petition got as far as it did makes it. Do you know about that part of it? I know that there was one, but it, I don't know how far it got. It got really successful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, that's what I've been doing: drinking black sarcophagus fluid and touching cursed dresses. Yeah. Speaking of black, that's the color of my new laptop that I got. Yeah. Black, the black sarcophagus got it. I was trying to yeah. piece it together where you... Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. So. Um, I've been wanting a new laptop that's like... So, here's the thing. Not... not f- 10 wafts? How many how many wafts ago did I get the last laptop that I talked about? It was I when don't Titanfall know. it was when Titanfall 2 came out. That's how I, I know don't that. I pay attention to you. I do. Were we I don't think we were doing wafts back then, were we? Yeah, we was cuz I talked about it because I distinctly remember talking Trick was there and I talked about Dishonored 2 and I talked about Titanfall 2. Cuz those were the games uh-huh. that came out that I played on my laptop. Um, but anyways, I, I had a laptop that was a, uh, basically I wanted something more for like video editing and stuff. And like my, my thing was like, Hey, like work is more important than funsies. And I like, I wanted something that was going to be good for like doing video editing stuff and like gaming stuff would be nice, but that's not going to be a priority. So I ended up getting this laptop that was like, I think like two years old at the time I got it, maybe like a year and a half would be closer to the truth. Uh, But like, it had a pretty good graphics card. I think it was a 960M, 970M, one of those two. Which, you know, runs most modern games on medium settings. Yeah. Um, Um, You could do better than medium on most games with that. Yeah, well, so here's the deal. That's only one half of the equation. The other half of the equation is your CPU. And... uh, it was an i7, but it was an older generation i7 that was, like, a generation or two behind. So the CPU was the real bottleneck of that system. Um, so basically what that meant is I could do... And, like, the RAM was good, so, like, that wasn't a problem. It was literally just the CPU. It was a problem of, like, hey, I can do video editing really well. I can play games really well. Can't do a lot of, like, high-performance things at once, though. Or for some games that really are cpu demanding that's gonna be a problem too so what i ran into is that like 
while I could play most of the games I wanted to play fine, like, I was able to play Sea of Thieves on it, which came out this year on medium settings, and it was fine. As soon as I turned anything to, like, high, it started to, like, chug a bit, though. Uh, yeah, I was on, like, ultra with that shit. Yeah. Uh, the problem, though, came with, hey, I like doing the YouTube thing, and oops, I guess recording PC games while also trying to run them and have them look decent was a problem. Uh, which I know everyone in the world other than me thinks those early PUBG streams we did looks fine, but they're just, like, too grainy for me, and, like, I look at other people's, like, videos and I'd be like, oh, I feel bad. Um, and also, like, I just could not stream Battletech, which was a game I was super excited to stream, just because that, well, the problem with that game is that, like, all of the enemies are, like, distinguished by, like, different health bar, like, the enemy's arms have health bars, the enemy's face has a health bar, the enemy's knees have a health bar, like, it's very CPU and numbers intensive on top of looking pretty damn good for, like, a turn-based, like, XCOM-style thing. And, like, OBS in that game just did not play well at all. It was a fucking slideshow. So, like, I could stream it, but not really record it. And, like, even then, streaming it, it, it looked like shit. So, at some point, I'm like, fuck it. I, I need something better, and I just don't want to worry about this. So, I I, I did the thing, and I, I got in touch with the friend who is good at doing the whole computer building thing. Because, for, first of all, for people who are not aware of the computer building space or like gaming space in general you got two options you can buy the pre-owned thing which a lot of the times comes with stuff you maybe not don't necessarily want or need um or you could build and way back closer to like the early 2010s building was like almost always the cheaper option unless you found a deal or something now the whole cryptocurrency bullshit happens and parts are being bought up left and right and greatly, like, fucking up the market and the pricing of all these parts because Bitcoin miners want to get in on this shit, and they're just snatching everything up. So for the past, like, two years now, it's actually been cheaper just to buy the pre-built machine, um, which apparently has drawn the ire of many people. It has been a very big point of frustration for the people who are, like, way into the shit. Uh, frankly, I've always been more on the software side of things, so, like, I understand PC parts, I just don't understand how to put the shit together, like, the actual innards of it all. Like, I took, like, a class in, in college at one point, and, like, I don't remember most of that shit, because I changed majors. Um, so I talked to my friend about it, and the thing that they don't tell you is that, yes, it is cheaper to build again now, but the problem is that the Bitcoin miners still have those fluctuations and waves where sometimes they'll just buy all the shit. So it actually takes longer than it used to now, still. <laughs> like, they've just permanently fucked this thing. Yeah. Um, but then it, what I ended up realizing is that it didn't matter, because, honest to God, I don't think I want a desktop computer again in my life. Like, I just, I just don't need one. I, Man, I said that, but I actually ended up loving the one I got. Like, I... I so, <laughs> fun. I have never recorded a WAF at a desk. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't set up my desk. But I, oh, I have yeah. my desktop hooked up to my TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, that works better for, for you than it would for me. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. So, like, I just value the portability too much. And also, like, um, I was like, hey, yeah, this, this would be fun to have for work stuff too. But, like, honestly, this is, like, the first computer I've ever bought where it's like, this is for entertainment shit. Uh, and I ended up getting the Predator Helios 300, which, fun story. So Amazon Prime Day happens, and I actually didn't buy anything through Prime Day because there's a strike going on. Don't know how many people know. I'm assuming most of our listeners have probably at least heard of this tangentially. Uh, there is a Prime Day strike going on because, hey, Amazon treats its workers like shit, and what day to boycott them other than their, like, their most profitable day. Um... So I was like, oh, damn, I want this, but I also don't want to buy from Amazon. Yeah, so, hey, they were so successful that the website went down for a bit. I don't think that worked. It didn't work. It, it was also, like, even after that, they um they reported that it was their most successful Prime Day ever. So that yeah. was a shame. But I wanted to support the principle of the thing. Yeah. Um, so I did end up being able, through some connections, getting a place that would um price match, which from what I understand, isn't normally a available thing for, like, something that close, like, a Prime deal, but I knew a guy. <laughs> so that was nice, and I managed to get the computer for the Prime Day price 
uh, of 900, which is not fucking cheap <laughs> still. No, hey, that's that's around what I spent on my computer. Yeah. Um and it's I think it's like 1200 normally like oh god, I I couldn't I would I would not feel great spending money for that full price. So I'm happy I got it for the price I did. Um but yeah, uh and I I was happy I managed to get it without doing the Amazon stuff or whatever. And I was like, yay, new computer. Uh, I got the Predator Helios 300, which I, I can't, cause like I, I, I looked in like reviews and stuff and people are like, yeah, for this price point, this is like the best, like, this is probably your best bet. There are better computers out there, but there is a huge price gulf between like this one and other ones. And also you start to get diminishing returns past a point where it's like, Hey, do you want to get 55 to 60 FPS in like a game like PUBG? You can go with this one. Do you want to get a constant 60 FPS uh, frame rate in PUBG? You can get this one, but it's also going to cost you about $400 more. And personally, I I don't care enough. You know? <laughs> I just want to be able to play the games and have them run decent and be able to record them and have that yeah. not be a problem. I don't... I do not need 4K gaming right now, honestly, on this thing. Though I think technically with some games it can do it. Uh, it's VR ready, but also I don't have any interest in Vive because PlayStation's been more than good enough for me on that front. Um, and the CPU is a lot better, and I can even like even I notice like making thumbnails in Photoshop and stuff. Like Photoshop opens and closes so much faster; it's so nice. Uh, my video render times take about an hour or less now too, which is wonderful. So, yeah. Uh, but also too, I I noticed after the fact that I bought this. Um, I started hearing the word Predator Helios 300 everywhere, and, like, all of those podcast advertisements for, like, the various gaming podcasts I used, or I used, yes, I used to listen to, no, um, all the gaming podcasts I listened to, this is the one that they all fucking shill for. Like, I bought the Dollar Shave Club of laptops, and I don't know how uh -huh. to feel about that. Use promo code ROSIN. Oh, no! I didn't even think about that! I'm part of the problem! <laughs> and they're not even paying me to do this. Promo code Rosin gets you 10% off if you buy it with a copy of Crack Legend of Gabos. Oh, yeah. But anyways, I've been back into PUBG now, and that's that's been fun. And yeah, I want to get back pack. into I want to get back into PUBG at some point. It's uh, it's it's a thing. Yeah. So look forward to all that new content because Rosin has a new computer. Only don't because he has no time to use it. Yeah. The monkey's paw of having money. Hey, Elon Musk, how do you feel about the Predator Helios 300? Uh, well... That's uh, fine. Fr French, French Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> do you know how that started, by the way? Uh, I think so, yeah. Yeah, okay, just... For everyone at home. <laughs> there was a guy who was a verified Twitter user. I don't remember. I think he was like a journalist or something. Um, I, I don't fucking know who he was or whatever. But there's just some dude who like when everyone was dogpiling on Elon Musk or whatever. R rightfully so. I say dogpiling <laughs> like it wasn't deserved. No. But everyone uh, is being so mean. <laughs> so probably, mean. So you mean. You probably have like 10 viewers who are right now very upset that you're making fun of Elon Musk. Probably, but fuck those people. Uh, go make like a tiny submarine and fuck off. Um, but yeah, so when everyone is given Elon Musk shit, uh, there's this one dude who changed his Twitter account to just be Italian Elon Musk, and he just changed his picture on Twitter to Elon Musk with a shittily drawn, like, <laughs> mustache, and Twitter de-verified his account. <laughs> <laughs> which is like the dumbest way for that to happen but i also like the idea that there was like a board meeting at like twitter headquarters where they were like oh fuck we got we gotta take this guy's twitter verification away yeah because um, he's not italian elon musk he is in fact not italian elon musk so now elon musk's of all nationalities have been on twitter yeah um man that's like my most popular tweet ever Wait, what? Did you, see, did you see my most popular tweet ever? No. My MS Paint Nero Automata fan art? Oh, yeah. I I can't I believe just... you ruined Square Enix's competition. 
I know I did. No, um, so like two days later, they start. They actually did. <laughs> okay, okay. I liked the fan theory you had going that you <laughs> completely ruined the sweepstakes with your meme. So, image. so in case no one knows what I'm talking about, which is no one. <laughs> yeah, the Nier Automata official Twitter was like, "Oh, we're gonna do like a, a, a fan art contest. Uh, send us your fan art, and we'll retweet like the best ones." And I just, because I'm a fucking shit, did one of my uh, hashtag artistic MS Paint fan arts of the picture they wanted. And for some reason, it was by far the most popular tweet on there. Um, <laughs> by, like, a lot, too. <laughs> by, like, hundreds. Yeah. And, like, I was getting all of the comments of people going, like, this one's gotta win. This is perfect. <laughs> for, like... Four days, my Twitter was just blowing up with people liking and retweeting it. Um, thankfully, because there was some really good art in there, once the uh, account actually started retweeting other art, they got way more likes than mine. <laughs> so I have been dethroned. That's but good. Well, while, while they hadn't announced any winners, I was clearly the most popular post there. But also, um, it's the fact that, like, they didn't say anything about the competition for, like, two days yeah. after you tweeted yours. So, they said it was a competition for that Friday. It was Fan Art Friday. They were going to do it later that day. And, like, two days went by with no word <laughs> from the Twitter account. And, like, I was sitting here going, like, okay, they can't retweet my art. But... They said in the post that, like, all skill levels were allowed. So they're at a point where I felt like they were trapped. <laughs> but they did not retrieve my art, but I am happy and satisfied knowing that someone at Square Enix's PR had to look at my fan art. Because <laughs> there's no way they could have avoided it. Uh... So, yeah, that was by far the best thing that happened to me in the past month. I also bought PlayStation VR, though. Yeah. Tell us um, about PlayStation VR. I'm not going to spend too long on this, because Rosin has detailed his adventure quite extensively. But I did take some notes. And the first thing I want to talk about with PlayStation VR, that I don't think people really talk about much, is that the graphics are fucking terrible. It's... Yeah. And, like... I don't think people talk about it because there's so many other things to talk about. Because there's think, so much cool about it. So I feel like the thing with me is that it's like PS3 level, and that's good enough for me. It's like low PS3 level. Yeah, but like it's still good enough that like it. when I first put it on, I was a little bit surprised by how low resolution it was. But like yeah. I was so immediately taken in and like... It still was fine enough that I was like, it's it is. fine. And I, I I, was gonna say, like, the immersion that it gives is a fair trade-off. I'm fine with it. I just was a little taken aback because no one talks about it. Yeah. And, like, especially when you look at things at a distance, they're they're a little choppy and blurry in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. um, the worst one for this was Skyrim, which I was very excited to play. And I know you, you hate Skyrim way more than I do. Um... Yeah. I like Skyrim. I was just kind of done with it. But I needed a VR game, you know? Uh, and I got the Skyrim bundle. And that's, like, the biggest world you can get in VR. But thankfully, like, a week or so after I got my VR bundle, they actually released a huge patch for Skyrim VR. Which or I, if you have I, a I PS still Pro. Had, I need to return to that. I'm probably going to start a new save, honestly, because I want to play with all the new stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, so I if, can clearly, but, like, I, I, I need to restart. If you've got a PS4 Pro, which both me and Rosin have, I also did that too. I, I traded in my PS4 and upgraded to the Pro. But um, yours is more worth it because you have a 4K TV, so... Yeah, yeah. But, uh... Yeah, if you've got the PS4 Pro, Skyrim now actually looks great. Like, again, it, it looks like a PS3 game, but a lot of the blurry and choppiness has gone. So they you... updated the controls and everything. Did you... I can't remember the timeline in my head because I don't keep track of your purchase history <laughs> um did you manage to play psvr on the vanilla ps4 yes okay so you see the difference right uh so it, here's the thing because there is one but like it's not a lot <laughs> it's it's a minor difference it wasn't what i thought it was going to be but the the benefit comes from like 
if something is optimized for the pro, that's where you see it. So and, like the the new Skyrim patch is for the pro. So that is a huge difference because it's optimized for the pro and that's where you see the benefit. Yeah. And like for other like Resident Evil 7 was one where like the edges of your peripheral vision are like more clear and like it adds a lot of like corner of the eye visibility which like adds a lot to that game in my opinion like stuff I'm, like that's fun i'm gonna be honest i don't think the ps4 pro is worth it i i i'm cool with my upgrade because i didn't pay anything for it i traded in my ps4 i traded in my vita and i haven't played my vita in like six years so fuck that thing yeah um so i'm i'm not like upset that i upgraded i'm fine with it but if you're someone that is like gonna be paying out of pocket for the pro honestly it's not worth it especially for the 4k stuff because, like, no 4K Blu-rays is a big bummer. And 4K streaming is not really a thing. So, like, can you, honestly, can yeah. You, it's a... Can you buy 4K movies from the movie store? Like, Not really, no. Okay. There's really no reliable way to watch 4K movies on the PS4 Pro. Huh. Uh, Xbox One X can do it, so. Is Netflix if, if Ultra or whatever the fuck the 4K plan is available? Like, that's the only thing I could think of. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it is, but I could do, like, Netflix, Netflix 4K is kind of iffy anyway. I wonder, oh. does the, can you watch video, because, like, I remember for PS3, you could, like, watch videos off, like, a thumb drive. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Damn. Maybe. It, 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 it's, That'd also it's, be a, a very it, inconvenient way to go about doing yeah. that, too. It's, it's just, like, there's, there's no reliable way. Like, the yeah. fact that sony isn't putting 4k blu-rays on their thing like come on um so yeah ps4 pro not really worth it psvr so worth it i good. love this fucking thing man um again not gonna dwell too much i just want to get a few things out there um one uh i think that when you're when you're not in vr which let's be like a lot of people let's do this aren't going to be like i'm sure a lot of you guys don't have the vr yet um, you you take a look at the games that are coming out for it, and they're all like thirty to forty dollar, four to five hour experiences, mm-hmm. and that seems like it's a bummer. It's not. <laughs> uh, it's not. That's exactly what you want. Yeah. Because you don't want to be playing VR for fifteen hours. I think that having those little experiences peppered in with uh, the occasional game like Skyrim or Resident Evil, where it's a big world that you can always come back to. Uh, I think VR is on fire way more than I thought it was before I bought the thing. Yeah. And if you're not, w- when we were watching E3 stuff, my eyes would always glaze over the VR section. Now that I have it and I'm looking like there's a VR game coming out like every other week. Yep. Like it's so much. Now more to than be I fair, a lot of them are shit, but still. Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah, but sure. They're, I mean, uh, like Minecraft you... graphics VR games are like a, a subgenre at this point. If you look yeah. through the PS Store, that that and like shitty horror titles. Really. <laughs> yeah, like the fucking uh, was is it the extra? What what is the fucking movie tie-in? The well, there's the Paranormal Activity one. There's a no, but there's like a an episodic one that's like that just like is it the Conjuring? Maybe, I don't know. I'm going to look it up. But, like, it's every time you go in, it's like, oh, the top of the PSVR charts. It's like the shitty episodic, like, horror thing. But uh, did you see The Persistence? I was about to ask you about that because I have not yeah. played it yet, but I want to. So I haven't played it yet, but I was looking into it today. It's like 30 bucks, and it's this uh, sci-fi stealth roguelike where you're on, like, a, a an abandoned space station, and you got to sneak around and do stealth kills on enemies and... uh randomly generated areas it looks super fucking cool and super fucking scary (laughs) so um i'm not gonna lie i saw that game and i was i watched a video on that game from like ign or or something it was an interview with like the main dude where it was like half interview about what the game played like and half like just showing shit from the game and like at some point the dude said something like uh yeah if you like system shock or deus ex just pick this up and i was like sold (laughs) so (laughs) uh apparently yeah. there's a lot of influence from that so that's cool I-, I can definitely see it in the aesthetic uh i would say in terms of gameplay it's more of a kind of just a simple stealth roguelike but apparently though the world is kind of a little like um immersive simmy where there's some stuff like that going on but like it's not like pre-built like it's still all randomly generated rooms and shit but apparently there's some degree of like interactivity there which sounds fun 
Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, but like between that and like upcoming games, like uh, I think we're both going to pick up Firewall, right? Yeah. Uh, Firewall is going to be like a multiplayer shooter, so we should we should try to get on that at some point and play together. Yeah, you need um, the I've, you I've need the, the dumb gun. I well, I've got it. I've got the bundle pre-order that comes with the gun in the game. Oh, I didn't realize that was going to be a thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, Zone of the Enders, From Software's thing. Like, there's so many games that uh, I still, I, I'm super into it. I still need to play Moss because that seems like. Yeah. That seems like the one thing that I first talked about where it's like, I want more than just the first person games. Like, I want a, a, a solid ass platformer thing. Yeah, Moss, I mean, I played the demo. It was super cute. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just, I think there's so much that can be done with it. And I'm, I'm, I, I don't think that it's the kind of thing where you play it every day. Yeah, definitely not. But if if you're okay with spending like two hundred bucks on something that's gonna give you a new experience every once in a while, it's way more worth it than I thought it was. And for what it's worth, Skyrim was worth it alone for me. And again, I know it's Skyrim. Say like generic fantasy, whatever, but like I love generic fantasy. And just being able to walk around that world and see something like that in a way I never have where like Walking underneath a bridge is the coolest fucking thing in the world, you so, know? Like... So I will say, my thing with Skyrim, and, like, I do that with a lot of these Bethesda games, where it's, like, I want to try for the as long as I can playing those games without using the fast travel and, like, kind of, like, having to deal with, like, this is a world, and, like, I want to... Yeah. Like, because... I know this is not a lot of people's jams, but I love that shit where it's like, I want to, like, fucking have a goddamn plan of, like, okay, I'm gonna go to this town and, like, try to, like, plan out a schedule of, like, what I want to all hit in this area and not just, like, oh, yeah, I'm warping from across the whole goddamn Skyrim, you know? Yeah. Um, and I will say, for, like, every fucking Bethesda open world game, uh, e including even New Vegas, which isn't really one but kind of is one, I eventually always got to a point where I'm like, I, fuck it, whatever, about, like, 20 hours in, 15 hours in, where it's like, I'm just gonna fucking start fast traveling, like, this was fun while it lasted, but I don't care anymore. Skyrim VR is probably the first one of those where it's like, no, it's worth it just to walk around. It really is, just, like, just the little things of, like, oh, yeah, this, this shop has a sign, and I could go up and look at the sign. Yeah. And, like, that sound, it's so impossible to convey what it's like because you don't think about those things when you're playing the game how how the vr people call them flat god <laughs> have I, you seen that no vr vr people are now referring to playing non-vr games as playing them flat oof <laughs> it's it's so that douchey. is the douchiest thing <laughs> yeah but it's true you really don't notice that kind of thing when you're playing the game like that and it's the little immersive details that make it worth it. And Skyrim for me is as like a, a whole new world of that game. I played that game to death in 2011, but what I didn't play was the DLC. Yeah. I haven't played any of the DLC and I'm actually really excited to do that stuff uh, in VR for the first time, especially the last one. Cause that brought like a whole new continent. So I'll actually have a new area to explore in VR and that's pretty cool. Um, I'm I'm still I want I know we're probably not gonna get one if like probably for a long time but like I want a game at that scale, uh, just with writing I like more than Skyrim's and combat I like more than Skyrim's yeah. <laughs> because the best part of that game is like honestly the world design and VR helps that a lot but like when I get into fights I'm like I I don't like this so so I'll say this for for that and I feel like I'm here's where I'm gonna lose even more people. I will never play Skyrim without motion controls again. Oof, um, yeah. I <laughs> fell in love with those motion controls, but I needed a little tweaking to get there. So I guess that means you're playing it on Nintendo Switch. Hey, hey, hey. Um, so I am uh, done with teleporting in, in VR games. I hate it. I don't want to teleport. I don't want to snap. If your game does not have free roaming options, I don't care. I, I like I hate teleporting in VR games. It takes me out of it immediately. It's it's weird. So it's weird yet also is the less sick option, which I find fascinating, but still. And and hey, I never had any issues with motion sickness. It never hit me. Not once. The only time I got remotely sick was when like Skyrim glitched out and put a horse in my face. Yeah, glitches um, are a problem for yeah. me. Like they they 
What was the game where I got where I on stream just was like, oh, was it Thumper where I clipped through the floor? Yeah, I think so. And I was just like, I need to take a minute. Um, that was a bad one. But with with the Skyrim motion controls, what I did not realize is that there's a second option that you could set to where instead of doing the teleporting, because the the motion controls don't have an analog stick, yeah. but instead of doing the teleporting, you could just have it to where you hit a button and you walk where you point. And it took a little bit to get used to, but once I did, it felt really intuitive. Um, so that, combined with being a mage and just doing exclusively magic, makes the combat actually fun for the first time in the entire history of Skyrim. Because <laughs> pointing your hand at an enemy and shooting lightning is fun. Like, no matter what the game is, that's fun. I, it's more fun than wiggling a sword around. I, I definitely will say, yeah, like, the melee combat is oof. Um, and... I, I did have a lot of fun shooting the bows and arrows and stuff. I couldn't get used to the archery with the motion controls at all. I yeah, I, I kind I tested out the motion stuff. I was like, this ain't for me, and I just kind of went hey, back to controller. I'm gonna I'm gonna they 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 updated them to make them a bit better. Yeah, I I'll, I'll check them out again for sure. Check them out again with magic. I I will do so. I I use magic the first time. Yeah, or, but I I don't know how much they've improved just magic casting wise yeah try it out with magic and try it out with the not teleporting but with the pointing where you walk yeah and it's it's very immersive and that's what it's all about the only vr game that i really wish i could play that i haven't is abduction which is the game by the makers of mist and it's a very mist like game yeah. it's that sort of first person uh puzzle thing um apparently it's really really bad on vr like uh, it's not well optimized so it's blurry and choppy um, I'm going to hold out hope that they patch it and then I'll do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and the last VR thing I have is Wipeout, which is the greatest VR experience I've ever had. That's really great. Like, uh, again, and this is just me, I turned all the comfort stuff off. They start you off with like a, a, a filter around, like like you're in like a little tunnel, uh, vision. tunnel vision. Turn that shit off. I want full view. Turn all the comfort options all the way off. And then just speeding as fast as I can in a first-person view race with invaders must die blaring in my ears. <laughs> Fucking heaven, dude. I was so, so in. <laughs> so, uh, Wipeout yeah, that's, good. that's VR garbage. You're probably going to hear more about that on this podcast because we both fucking have this shit now. Yeah. Dude, I'm, like, not going to lie, though, like, still fucking zone of the enders is the most profound gaming experience i've probably had in the last decade <laughs> and it was that was just the fucking demo of like five minutes uh, i'm looking forward to zone of the enders the one thing i will say is like i think i told you this but uh there was that game that was free on ps plus i think it's star blood arena or something like that yeah um that game sucks like the game itself is really boring it's just a kind of shitty like uh arena combat thing but the mech controls are so amazing and like i got angry at how much i loved the controls of that game <laughs> like i want those controls in a game like zone of the enders i like not i want them to make fucking uh steel battalion vr like yeah. that's what you do with that series now Dude, if you try it again please at some point just boot up that like arena game just to feel the controls i will i will I feel like, like I have actually. It's just it didn't stick with me necessarily. Once but you start I, like moving like backwards and up while shooting down, like oh man, it's so good. I uh, I um also will pair what I what, what you kind of said with that zone of the Ender's demo. I paid way more attention to the geometry and layout and just overall world design of that first area of Zone of the Ender's two in VR. More than I ever did playing that game on a <laughs> PS3. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. I need to watch your uh, Let's Play the first game of Johnson so I can just jump into the second one. Hell yeah. Oh, capture card difficulties. It's, hey, it's fine. It's better than playing that game. I tried. I couldn't get into it. Yeah. No, you can... You can... Yeah, it'll, it'll be better. You can you can experience that game's wonderful voice acting and rip off Evangelion Gundam plot in all of its glory. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Johnson didn't want to play the Game Boy Advance strategy RPG with me. I can't oh, believe I'm sorry. it. Yeah. It's okay. I got him back by making him play Mega Man X7 with me. <laughs> Fuck 
fucking nerd. Dungeon mastering. Yeah! <laughs> I didn't know how to transition that. Speaking of virtual realities... So, I threw down my phone on my bed. That was what that noise was. Um, I... I've been wanting to do this West Marches style tabletop game thing for a while. And... Yeah, it was originally going to be a No Brand Sky. Yeah. Oh, I have a fun story to tell you about No Brand Sky. Oh. Yeah. So, and No Man's Sky coming later in the docket. Uh, we've come full circle. Um, so, I've been wanting to do this West Marches style campaign for a tabletop thing for a while. Now, for those of you who... Honestly, I'm not even going to say for those of you unfamiliar with tabletop uh, RPG stuff, because th this is kind of like even a weird niche and style of play within that. Uh, basically, most tabletop games are designed to be played by a consistent group of about four to six people. You can do a little bit more, a little bit less. You kind of just got to adjust the rules of whatever game you're playing to make that work. Most of them are balanced for about four to six players. And then one person running the game as a game master, dungeon master, whatever you want to call it. I think Call of Cthulhu calls them lore keepers, which is great. Um, West Marches is a style of game, which is a sandbox style game where you basically create a world map. Uh, a lot of people prefer to do it on like a hexagon map. Uh, and then you create like a base of operations uh, for party members. And then you just have a not very consistent like style of play where you have you can have a, a shit ton of people playing the game but they don't have to feel the need to come in every session you're not really telling an ep like a overarching story you're telling like little mini arcs and like episodic adventures um and it's very modular so like you can just kind of be like oh hey uh let's explore the forest today and then you can just kind of slap in any old dungeon map that you have laying around and be like okay explore this um and you kind of get the sense of, like, a living sandbox world, depending on how you play it. Uh, but you also have the uh, sense of, like, a, a great, like, kind of like a miniature army being formed if you have enough players. Uh, currently, I have about 15 people playing. Uh, and there's only, like, two people who, like, regularly are in it so far. Um, so, like, you just get, like, this large sense of, like, a shifting cast and, like people will, like, explore, like, a ruined, like, forest thing that I'll set up, and then, like, a different party will come in, and they'll see all of the stuff in that area that the previous party did, um, and they'll be like, what the hell happened here, and they'll have to figure it out, and sometimes you, you get things where, like, characters will show up, um, and there will be one person in the party who knows who that character is, and they kind of have to use that party member as, like, a point of contact by, like, oh, is this person to be trusted, or, or whatever, it creates this, like, great sense of this living, breathing world without having anyone feel like they have to, like, spend a Saturday, like, every week for, like, months on end to, like, be told this great, like, consistent narrative and then feel guilty when they can't make it. Um, it also is just a lot of fun for me as, like, a person who likes world building and running uh, Dungeon Master stuff because, like, I can just make a bunch of random shit uh, and then throw it at the party and then after a session, I can go, okay, how does this impact the rest of the world around that area? How does this impact the NPCs I've set up so far? Uh, what are all the individual factions? And, like, say you take out a troll that's inhabiting this tower. Well, that might mean that this weird cult that the party hasn't run into yet notices that. And they decide to move in and creates, like, a power vacuum. There's a lot of fun stuff. Uh... There's a lot of great videos that you can find, great, like, blog write-ups. Uh, it's West Marches is the style of game. Marches is spelled M-A-R-C-H-E-S. Um, it's really great if you have enough people to do it with. Or, honestly, it, it's not even a thing, like, if you have enough people and you want to do it. it. It's a lot better for my situation, where it's like, oh god, I have too many people who want to participate in this thing. This is the only style of game that would feasibly work for us. Um... It's fantastic. Uh, for anyone interested in join joining, this is technically a public game. Um, you just need to be a part of my Discord, which I have linked to in like every video description I do. Uh, we just ask that you don't be an asshole, um, and if you are, we'll 
ban you from the server, which luckily has not happened yet. Everyone's been very cool. Wow, um, the Iron Fist of Rosin. Hell yeah. No, it's great. We got we got the moderators in on it playing too, so yeah, we've been able to keep any ne'er-do-wells away, and everyone's been very lovely so far, which is great. It's honestly, it ended up being more popular than I thought it would be, and like, it felt really good, because like, I had a session which I was felt really, really damn proud of, and like, there's just like, as we were all like, retiring to bed at like 2am, uh, like, just someone quipped, like, that was probably the most fun I've had playing d d in, like, a, a year or something, and I was like, hell yeah! So, yeah, that was great. Nice. It's been good. And I've been watching a shit ton of Matt Colville videos. That guy knows his stuff. <laughs> hey, I need something to... I Dude, okay, I thought I listened to too many podcasts, and then work happened, and, like, I need eight hours of podcasts every day. Yeah. Oh, fuck. Oh, oof. So, yeah, I've gone through all of Matt Colville's... <laughs> running the game time, videos <laughs> time to start back on critical role dude okay so i tried i can't <laughs> i can't follow the narrative when i'm writing it's too hard to write yeah, I'm it's, sure. it's too hard to write and keep track of that compared to like something a little more casual so so critical role has been hard to listen to while working um i mean i i, I can't even listen to it i gotta watch it so yeah um because, like, I legitimately tried, and, like, I just kept finding myself rewinding, and I'm like, this is stupid. I'm, I'm not gonna do this. Dude, Camp A2 is getting real good. I, uh, I, I do plan to get back in. Though, honestly, too, like, there's a thing where, like, there's part of me that's like, yeah, I could watch Critical Role, but also, like, like, one of my go-to, like, for fun things is I'll, I'll, I'll throw on a playlist of my favorite songs, and I'll just start to be, like... I'll just go to random parts of my world map and be like, what, what stupid shit can I put here? Like, <laughs> what like, a nerd. Like, may I know, but still, like, maybe this <laughs> is a ruined port town. And, like, not, and, like, it's been kind of fun, too, because, like, I've only had so much time to prepare and do stuff because, like, limited free time. Uh, and, like, last night I ran a game, I ran a game with, like, severely limited, like, like, I drew probably the shittiest maps and, like, shit wasn't even aligned properly to the roll 20 grid. It was, like, kind of a mess. And, like, I made, like, the most bootleg, like, temple layout and, like, a bunch of other bullshit. And I was like, oh, God, this is going to be a mess. And um, one of the other things I should point out is that, like, I don't, as the DM, be like, okay, this is kind of the direction people are going to go in. I create, like, a Monster Hunter-style list of missions, and then the party collectively votes on what mission they want to take. Yeah, there's there's not, like, a, a ongoing narrative, per se, right? No. Um, there are, so, like, what and how I've kind of managed that, because also, too, there's part of me that's, like, I don't want everything being exactly episodic, so what I do is I set up, like, there are things that are, like, miniature arcs, but also I don't want anything, I, I, my overall goal for this is I want people who play to be, like, oh, yeah, there's a story that, that I'm adding to, but I also never want there to be a point where someone jumps in, wants to make a character real quick and play, and this is their first time playing anything like this, and they don't know what the fuck is going on. The, like, all that you ever are going to need to get caught up is, oh yeah, there's a cult in the woods and we ran into them a few times. You know, yeah. like, I that's my goal for this. And so far it seems like we've been able to hit on that so far, uh, and that's been great. But yeah, I don't know, I legitimately do not know before we start playing, like, what, 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 like adventure are y'all gonna do today are we gonna go to the forest are we gonna go to this weird sea cave are we gonna go sailing like i don't fucking know it's great it's been a, a good challenge for me um and yeah also like not gonna lie there's like matt colville made a tweet recently like man all of us old dm people make like how to dm videos but like i want to see more like young people who like are new to this making like videos on how to dm and it's like i I, I don't necessarily want to do that, because, like, I not, I don't think I'm very good at the DM, honestly. Um, but, like, I do want to do some videos on, like, world build. Like, I think I've talked about this on this podcast before. I like world building just as a thing. Like, yeah. I gave up on, like, a writing... I, I'm not going to say career. I never planned to write for a job. Fuck that. Uh, though I do technically write for a job, I guess, but just blogs and you don't, you don't write fiction i don't write fiction yeah i write promotional materials materials for, for, for promotional materia yep i make promotion <laughs> i craft promotional material for the honda civic that's my life now um no but it's been a great challenge oh wait no that's not what i was going <laughs> i did transition away from my point um <laughs> it's been a great challenge no um <laughs> 
Oh, you're flustered. I'm flustered. <laughs> no. <laughs> Broly, huh? <laughs> um, no, I, I think I do want to do a video or two or, like, a, a mini-series or something. An HBO limited time event. Um, on, like, how I world build, because I, it's just really fun, and, like, I never planned to do anything yeah. with it, and, like, tabletop has been the most practical usage of that pastime I've ever had in my fucking life, because I gave up on writing fiction long ago, because I suck <laughs> at it, so. I, uh, I love tabletop, um, like, just the concept, so, yeah. That's great. I gotta, I gotta get my game started back up. It took a, a break, because my players were on vacation, then I was on vacation, and then, like, it just, it's been hard to get my group back together, but I really want to get it Speaking started. of games that are on hiatus, Zach, a, a while yeah. back, we recorded a, a, a No Brand Sky intermission <laughs> podcast where we were going to relaunch the series as Rebrand Sky. <laughs> yeah, you don't say. And that podcast never went up. And Gee, of, I wonder why. <laughs> so part of that was laziness, but do you want to know the real reason? I assumed it was cancelled. <laughs> Um, I need to rework that, and if we ever want to get back into that and gotta talk to everyone else, because I, I, I've never not wanted to do that. It's just been hard to do, um, because, like, hey, those take a while to edit and all that or whatever. So, I, I, I'm gonna go on a limb and say that intermission will probably never see the light of day. That one won't. Um. We would have to so do a new one, because there's people, a reason for this. People will never hear it, but I... And I actually, I felt kind of bad, too. Like, I felt like I was being kind of mean. Uh, but I was very critical of No Brain Sky in that. You were? Yeah, you don't remember. Oof. No. I, I feel like I was so, very critical of No Brain Sky. The only thing I actually... So, here, to be fair, I think we recorded this in, like, January? It was, it was a while ago. I don't know if it was that long ago, but it was a while ago. It was long. It was winter. Yeah. Um, what were you saying? I forgot who his turn it was to speak. Yeah, I thought you had more to say. I oh, no, no, no. That. The only thing I remember were, like, the plot hooks I set up for the new characters. And also yeah. my, my, my premise of what module I was going to run, which is where the problem came in. I... Oh, there's a problem. Yes, but but you you continue your your criticism of No Man's no. Sky. <laughs> no, yeah, I, no, I was gonna say people are never gonna see this, so they're never gonna really know. But yeah. uh, I I ended up very unhappy with how No Man's Sky turned out, and uh, I felt kind of bad about it because I felt like I was the only one that that felt that way. And during that whole intermission, I was constantly being like, "Yeah, so when we go back, I kind of want to drop this, drop this, do more of this." Oh, okay, I remember that now. Yeah. I so for some reason when you said critical of No Brand Sky, I was thinking production value. No, I I, 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 I mean, don't know why my brain went there. <laughs> no, uh, I I just I just meant how how it was how it ended up overall. Yeah. Uh, but also I, I I feel like too um. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I I, I I'm almost kind of glad that intermission is ever gonna see the light of day because I almost felt like I was kind of too too negative during it oh. uh, uh but i do think if we ever do like a uh if we ever do go back to some kind of recorded D D thing i i would i would want it to be a bit different honestly i might just it, it would be at a much smaller scale i might just like with the group we have going now and also just the fact that like i think part of the no brand sky problem is like getting a consistent group was hard uh, no one with ever all our, with all of our schedules it was tough i mean everyone was kind of down to show up i just think it fizzled out yeah but i mean like it it, it felt like we, it, it was very hard to get everyone together for one of those sessions too you know which was yeah kind of there was always like one person was out here another was out yeah here. and i almost wonder if it would be better to like have more of like a, a west marches style thing going where like I just open it up more to, like, other people that, like, I have a feeling would be interested in, like, just doing it that way. Uh, honestly, and we talked a little bit about this in the intermission, too. It's it's either that or we take it more seriously. And yeah. I don't think any of us were at a point where we could. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Like, it's because also, too, y'all got to realize, 
every time we record one of these podcasts, this is this is a fucking weekend for me. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm putting all of my hour points into the podcast and getting it up. Um, I mean, I understand that. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> the people at home probably do not realize yeah. how long these take to edit. And all of the racism we have to edit out. Yeah, well, okay, I was also going to say, also, hey, as, as a DM myself, that prep takes a long time. Yes. Um... And when, when you spend uh, 10 hours prepping a game, and then your players go completely off the rails, you know, it's, it, it's hard to swallow that you have to throw out everything you would come up with and do something new. Which is where West Marches comes in, where if they go off the rails, oh no, I spent 50 hours preparing for this entire region. Which is also nice, but also, yeah. oh fuck, time commitment. That's um, kind of how I like to DM too. Not necessarily yeah. West Marches style, but I, I definitely like, uh, I always have a backup thread, just yeah. in case. Yeah. And they're not going to lie, there have been times where it's like, I go into this building, and under my breath, I'm like, I don't have this mapped out yet, so I'm just going to make a new Roll20 tab, and going to draw some some boxes, and we're going to use our imaginations, kids. <laughs> um, but those have been few and far between. Otherwise, it's been very smooth, and everyone seems to be very, very happy. And like it, like I said, I, I was expecting, like... Because people, like, I actually, it wasn't even my idea. Like, other people, like, were, like, kind of, like, we should get, like, a tabletop thing going. So I made a channel for it, and, like, we used it twice for, like, I, I think, like, a a Dungeon World session or two. And, like, we never went back to it. And it was just, like, we should get a thing going. But, like, no one wanted to necessarily run it or, like, knew how we could run it with that many people. Because, like, some some people work weekdays, some people work weekends, and I, hey, also, too, I'm trying to get more sessions scheduled that we can do during weekdays, because, like, there's some people who want to play, but they just can't, because weekends aren't a good time for them. Um, yeah. So. Also, I feel like, just in case it wasn't obvious, because you didn't say it, I'm not in that game. <laughs> yeah, you should be. Fucking join, nerd. Oh. Uh, mm. It's open. Everyone's in. Everyone's welcome. Wait. Maybe maybe at some point. Yeah. I'll have to make a character and, and read up on the lore. Oh, you know what? Hey, I want to talk about that. So, the week we start doing this, the first session we kind of had was a Friday where I helped a bunch of people make their character. Because we... Also, hey, I should point out, a lot of people in there, first time playing any tabletop thing. So, like, I'm doing my best to help everyone through this and get shit going. Uh, not gonna lie, though, too, what is also nice is someone invited one of their friends who has, like, hundreds of hours of, like, GM experience on Roll20 and, like, showed me the ropes of, like, some advanced feature shit I never knew about even. Uh, so that was really helpful. Uh, but also, it's nice because we have a nice mix of players and things that, like, have wide experiences with D&D stuff. So there's some people in there that, like... Because, like, when we played, like, we never gave a fuck about equipment. I mean, we didn't give a fuck about a lot of things, and I have since given a fuck more about things like advantage and disadvantage and proficiency bonus and all that stuff. Because yeah, well, we played fast and loose with all that. That's also, uh, and, and I, again, and I, sometimes I felt like in, in our games, I was kind of an odd man out in that, like, I cared a little bit more about rules, and I love D&D 5th Edition. And everyone else kind of didn't really care. Like, no one else in our group seemed to want to play D&D 5th Edition. Yeah. So, but I will say, that is a lot easier when we have three people on hand who, like, know that book pretty well. And it's like, what's falling damage again? And it's like, oh, it's 1d6 for every 10 feet. Like, just being able to have that and not have to flip through and pause and, like, kill the flow yeah. is a lot more helpful. Um... So that's been great. So we've been playing it more by the book. I'm still not allowing, like, feats, and I'm also not allowing, like, classes that aren't from the player's handbook just because, like, I don't want people to feel like they need a bunch of shit. Like, I want to keep this as accessible as possible. Yeah. Um, so I, I think feats are neat, though. They they are, but also, like... the ones like, in the book, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I just kind of feel like it... I, I, I try... I'm trying to, like, keep things exciting and have, like, enough stuff going on that, like, I hope they don't feel needed, but, like... I don't know. Um, I'm also I'm also playing a lot faster and looser with like magical item loot because I feel like I well not gonna lie I think I think five e just like in terms of progression I'm doing a my I I invented a weird halfway point leveling system between milestone exp and uh, regular exp 
Yeah. Um, I go full milestone because I'm not keeping track of that shit. <laughs> yeah, so, like, and, like, that's, a, like, and I'm not gonna lie, I still don't really give a fuck about inventory space stuff. Like, I, uh, how I always have handled inventory limitations in games is, like, I glance at the inventory, and if it starts to get, like, questionable, it's like, okay, we need to, let, let, let's think about that. You know what I mean? Like, I don't worry about it until it's probably time to worry about it, because, like, I just, I don't want people having to micromanage all that shit. Um, I, I want to keep the story going because that's at least the thing that I, I want people to take away from it and not like, oh, God, I need to know all this number shit. Um, but anyways, back to what I was talking about. So I, I spend like five hours helping out everyone get their character and shit. And that was a great experience. Then what happens is that we play on Saturday and then we get a new player who wants to join for like week two or whatever. Uh, and it's Wednesday. And we go to make their character sheet. And this thing called the Character Mancer opens up. Roll20 added an easy make your character thing for D&D literally the week after I helped like eight people make their thing. <laughs> I was so fucking... And like, it took it went from like each character taking about 30 to 40 minutes to like five. Like, it was ridiculous. It's... I don't know. Roll20 is a great program, though. <laughs> but yeah. No, so yeah, I've been I've been having fun doing that. Oh no no no, okay. Back to No Brad Sky though. This is the thing I was gonna talk about. This is uh, actually the thing that killed that revival attempt. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to run a module because it's easier for prepping and also hey, I had never run a like I had never proper bought and run a module before. One of the most famous modules of all time was an early, I think, first edition um module called uh the temple of elemental evil so famous in fact that it actually became a computer role-playing game which uh, apparently is, is kind of like a hidden gem in that like Baldur's gate style isometric rpg field kind of came out late too like it, it didn't sell well because it came out like early 2000s when that style of game was kind of dying out in favor of like the morrowind type thing um but that's besides the point. Temple of Elemental Evil is, like, a thing you just hear referenced a lot in D&D stuff. So I'm like, that probably is a good one. And, like, I look and I see, like, yeah, it's got great reviews and everyone's like, oh, it's a classic. So it's broken up into two parts. The first is a part called The Village of Hamlet, which was, like, th I think, like, $3 to buy on, like, DriveThruRPG or something. I don't know if I found it on sale or if that's just the price, but whatever, fuck it. Uh, and the one thing is that the game we were playing, Stars Without Number, was designed to specifically be compatible with all those old modules. Like, maybe you have to change an orc into a fucking, like, robot or something, but, like, rules-wise, it works basically identical. Just, just a little bit more convenient and nicer, because it's obviously a more modern game. So I'm like, this is perfect. This is awesome. And I'm reading through this Village of Hamlet thing, I'm like, this is awesome. This is great. It's gonna be great. So we record that podcast, and I'm like, okay, I better start doing some, some planning ahead. So I buy the second PDF, The Temple of Elemental Evil. I have never read a more incomprehensible book for anything in my life. <laughs> and I looked it up, and I keep finding forum threads that are like, what, what, like, just various questions of confused readers, like, how is this supposed to work? Lo and behold, I find a Matt Colville video where he's like, yeah, I recommend The Village of Hamlet, but the Temple of Elemental Evil sucks. No one knows what to do, and, like, people just give up and make up what happens in the second half. Because nobody gets what the actual story is supposed to be. Or how oh. the dungeon works. People just made up the rest and filled it in. So I went, fuck. <laughs> and I just kind of <laughs> lost all hope. So yeah. that killed that. But I legitimately, I don't understand how this thing became the big popular thing it is. Because, like, it has, like, a cool thing where, like, you it's this temple that links to a bunch of different planes of, like, elements... And you have to do a bunch of wacky hijinks to get this crystal ball to break so that the bad guy dies. But, like, there's just things that are referenced that it's like, oh, yeah, you know about the the thing over on the slope, right? And it's like, I don't actually. And, like, you control F for it, and it's not referenced anywhere. And it's like, what? <laughs> I, I don't know how high you were when you wrote this, but this is in comp Like, it legitimately feels like someone's GM notes that they then were like, oh, I can sell this. Oh, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. they had the second half of all of the dungeon stuff in their head. It's so fucking bad. Um, yeah, so that killed that. 
but I still want to do, I want to do more recorded tabletop stuff. It's just like, it's a hard, it's not, not going to lie, probably like on my end, the hardest thing for me to make. And it's hard to make it consistently because there's a lot that goes into it. And like, there's a lot of prep work and editing and all that. So yeah. And then you have players that get drunk during your game. Oh, that was the best. It was so good. <laughs> In space, there's no time. <laughs> Shoutouts to the four people who sometimes DM me asking where no Prince Sky is, by the way. <laughs> oh, you're precious, whoever you are. <laughs> I support you. Uh, I'm also sorry. But I do want to, I, I want that to still be a thing. I do. It's just, it's hard. <laughs> uh, um, well. <laughs> speaking of the future. Okay. I'm gonna. We're, I, we're, I'm. We're trying to keep our podcast a bit snappier than they used to be. Yeah. Oh wow. I'm gonna fucking that up already. Hey, I'm gonna run through the stuff I've been doing quickly. Okay. I'm. I'm gonna be quick about this. Okay. I played Detroit Become Human. Here's my seven-hour defense of Detroit Become Human. Oh no. <laughs> All right. Okay. I get it. And everyone, you're right. David Cage is a terrible author. <laughs> I, I hated every other game he's ever made. And Detroit Become Human is pretty bad. It severely mishandles its civil rights analogs. Everything it does has been done better before. And it is incredibly on the nose and blatant. But I really, really enjoyed it. Oh no! Uh, Zach, and... I, what did I tell you about having to spend all that time editing the racism out of the podcast? No. And <laughs> to be fair, I've heard that this is the cream of the shit crop of David Cage games. That seems it to is. be a consensus. Like even for people who don't like this game, it is by far his best. Do you um, do you think that's the Sony money? No. Okay. I think it's just hey. Fifth times the charm. <laughs> <'Cause>... <laughs> that makes sense. Because <laughs> there are scenes in this game that are clearly just redos of previous scenes he's had, and they work better here. Oh no. <laughs> um, I will also say that the path I took through the game had a lot less of the like really cringy civil rights stuff because I went violent. And violent plays more like a revolution than a civil rights march, you know? Yeah. So I had, you know, I didn't get, like, we have a dream. Yeah. I, I got, I got like, I'm going to shoot this human in the head. We're standing up for who we, you know? Um, so that that's that. I liked the characters is what it comes down to. Connor was a lot of fun. And there are some really good scenes. Uh, and I feel like this has started kind of a, a debate online over, like, well, I mean, hey, it started debate back when I wrote these notes, which was like a fucking month ago at this point, but whatever. Um, kind of started debate online about, like, should you be allowed to like something if it's got negative stuff in it or if the guy who created it's a bad person? Because, hey, guess what? David Cage is a bad person. <laughs> He's a shit. Um, and that's a really interesting conversation. Uh, unfortunately, I felt like I got really sick of a lot of the conversations surrounding this game, and I kind of tapped out. Um... But I think that there's a conversation worth having there. But I'm not going to have it here. All I'm going to say is, fuck it. I liked it. What can I say? You know? Sorry. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. I can't believe... I can't believe that you're going to become known from the Final Fantasy Thirteen Apologist Zack to the Detroit Become Human Apologist Zack. Okay, first of all, fuck you. <laughs> Second of all, don't you dare compare the garbage of david cage to the majesty of final fantasy 13 the best game ever made damn i will i will get one day one day i will finish that final fantasy 13 defense video damn but i might do an eight one first <laughs> i'm gonna i'm gonna make my fucking rpg rewind the final fantasy 13 is just gonna be me pooping over and over again no i want to be known as the guy that like relentlessly defends final fantasy 8 and final fantasy 13 so you gotta get you gotta get 
Okay, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. <laughs> so, what you need to do is make... You need to make your FF13 video. Yeah. But then you need to make the thumbnail lightning with googly eyes and a red arrow pointing at nothing. Yeah. And then in all caps, name the title SJWs Defend FFXIII? Question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. And yeah. then the alt-right will just throw money at your face because they're idiots. Yeah. Even though I'm clearly the SJW defending the game. <laughs> oh yeah, that doesn't work, huh? <laughs> Wait, I'm not... Yeah, but... <laughs> That's gotta be your video. No, I, I meant to say SJWs hate FF13. Question mark, oh, there, question there, mark, you question go, mark. there you go. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, no, I actually, I've, I've really been itching to replay Final Fantasy VIII. And I, I went on like a tangent a couple like weeks ago about how Skull's an amazing character. And I want to like replay that game to see if I was full of shit or not. So that's You can, maybe you can always bit. watch that one Let's Play. Uh, No. <laughs> anyway, so no, okay, uh, okay. <laughs> that will forever remain a mystery. The the last uh, waff we did together was the live one, and yes. while we were recording oh, that waff yeah. live, yeah, it's been a while, man. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> it's been a while. While we were recording that waff live, um, halfway through, I interrupted you with breaking news that Bloodstained Curse of the Moon was a thing. Yeah. And that since came out, and I played it, and that's one of my favorite games of the all fucking time. Yeah. Uh, that's definitely going to be on my game of the year list, that's for sure. And I'm not going to dwell on it too much. Hey, I actually made, like, a video about it, so if anyone's curious, head over to that fucking YouTube po channel I have. Post it in yeah. the doobly-doo down below. Yeah, post it the doobly-doo. Uh, I love Curse of the Moon. That's great. What a great Castlevania throwback. And then... um. Thanks to a very kind soul who wishes to remain anonymous, I actually got access to the uh, Ritual of the Night demo from the E3. Hell yeah. And I played through that, and that's a whole lot of fun. Very different from Curse of the Moon, but a whole lot of fun. And that sparked me to go on a Castlevania kick, so I've finally buckled down and started playing through some of those Egovania games that I never got to. Uh, in particular, I played Portrait of Ruin and Order of Ecclesia. Uh, and I love both of them. They're very good. I like how they do twists on the Egovania formula in different ways. And uh, yeah, those are great games. It's a shame that, that the DS series started to die around when they came out. But I think they're really good. Uh, that's all I have to say about that. I like Castlevania. Everyone knows that. I, I've given up on my Castlevania playthrough series. Don't ever okay. start playing a whole video game series through with someone you eventually break up with. Yeah, that's is, probably... Is, is what I'll say that with, because it doesn't get you in the mood <laughs> to yeah, go probably back. Not. Yeah, probably not. Uh, I like them, though. They're good. And They're good. I also like Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah. Did you know that, Rosin? No. Did you know that I am a fan of Sonic the Hedgehog? No, I knew that you were a big Mighty the Dillo fan. You want to try that one more time? Mighty the Dillo. Mighty, Mighty the Dillo is what we're going with. He is an armadillo, right? Uh, I, yeah, yeah, I think so. Mighty the Armadillo, that sounds right to me. Yeah. Um, So Sonic Mania Plus came out. Uh, I didn't pick up... I was going to pick up the actual like full thing on the Switch. I... Fuck that. I just spent $5 for the DLC unlock on the PS4 version. Yeah. Um, I love Sonic Mania. It's one of my favorite games of all time. Uh, definitely one of the best Sonic games out there. And I really enjoyed an excuse to come back to it. And I liked the Encore mode having little twists to the level design. It was fun to see things shaken up a bit. Um, man, those two new characters are garbage, though. Oh, so uh, I heard and... that Mighty glides like Knuckles, but without his, like, it's bad or something. Uh, Ray's, it might be who you think. So, oh, okay, okay. So the way Ray works, and the easier comparison is, uh, hey, did you ever play Super Mario World? Yeah, oh, oh. You know the cape? Yeah. that. It's that. That seems like that doesn't fit with that game's level design very well. It doesn't! Yeah. <laughs> you know what else sucks about it? 
is that you're completely vulnerable while doing it. Th that's the thing that I kept hearing, where it's like, you're never going to get a chance to use this because you'll just get hit out of it too fast. So, it's not just that. So, when Knuckles glides, the front of his body is an attack because of his Knuckles. Yeah, and he don't when have tails, it. When Tails flies, the tail is an attack. And you can do things with those. Ray is completely vulnerable when he's flying. He has nothing. And not only does that mean that you cannot hit enemies and you'll be knocked out of everything, but you can't even hit boxes and switches. So what's the fucking point? Yeah. It's terrible. It's a garbage character. I hate him. I'm sure speedrunners can probably do some shit if they know everything. But I was playing through slightly reworked levels, so I didn't know where everything was, and it fucking sucked. Um, Mighty is a bit better, but he's got, like, a ground pound that has no use. Like, like his ground pound, it, it, it's neat, but the game isn't built around it. And there's nothing to do with it. You you can bounce off spikes. It's kind of like a beginner character. Like, you have, like, a redo if you jump onto spikes. Oh. But, like, it's it's stupid. Like, it, none of them Did they play, like, that in good, Chaotix? I don't know. Well, only uh, Mighty was in Chaotix. Ray wasn't. Oh, okay. But, uh... But Ray isn't new, right? He kind of is. He was only in, like, a weird arcade spinoff that didn't play, like, a regular Sonic game before. Okay, okay, okay. Um... They need to add so the it's kind fucking, of a new style. Let's fucking add Bark the Polar Bear and being the dynamite back assholes. Well, I mean, they're in there as a boss thing. Ah, oh, fuck, you're right. God damn it. Holy shit. Yeah, <laughs> fuck me. Never mind. You're totally right. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I, I want to say, like, it's cool having two new characters, but I'd rather just play Sonic and Knuckles. Yeah. Uh, one thing I will say is that in addition to the, like, Encore DLC, uh, there was a huge patch that really polished the game up. And, like, you don't even need the DLC to get access to that patch, and it's really nice. So, uh, yeah, Sonic Mania is worth going back to. And, I mean, for $5, the, the Encore DLC is worth it. It's just I was... A bit disappointed in those characters. I was expecting more. Because they were kind of the big thing they were selling that on, it seemed like, right? Yeah. They really should have been selling the Encore mode, because that's way more interesting. Do you know like, how that works? That's, like, completely... Like, it's the same levels, but they're, like, remixed, right? So the kinda. levels are slightly remixed. Um, enemy placements, uh, trap placements, those things are a bit different. Um, you'll only notice it, really, if you have the previous mem like levels memorized, because the changes are slight, but enough yeah. um but the the real cool thing is uh the live system is is completely reworked for the encore mode instead of collecting lives you collect characters um so the five characters are all in that mode and when you die you just switch to the next character yeah uh That's so cool. there's there's no collecting lives you're only ever going to have at least five lives but there's like switching between characters like if you press the triangle button on playstation you'll just switch to your partner character and that makes for a lot of fun where you're like okay i've got like mighty and knuckles and i'm ground pounding with, with mighty but i want to climb up this wall so i switch to knuckles climb the wall switch back to mighty for the jump it, like th there's fun stuff in that mode so that's worth it honestly if you're into, into sonic mania um What's not worth it is No Man's Sky. Damn. So No Man's Sky got a big update as well. And I've heard nothing for the past two years, but yeah, man, those updates make No Man's Sky great. Like, like that game is finally what it was meant to be. Yeah, it's the, it's the same thing that I heard people talking about. <laughs> um, I will say that I do like the game a bit, but I just feel like its changes have been kind of overblown. And I really dislike how they integrated the new storyline into that game. Um, after like five hours, I'm kind of done with it. Unless people want to do co-op. Like, I feel like I could probably have a lot of fun with that game co-op. But as a single player thing, I'm kind of done with it. It really, it, I don't know. It, it didn't click for me as much as I was hoping it would. Yeah. It's it's one of those things. I, I still value my time I had looking around chasms and shit. Being attacked by weird crab things. Yeah. But it's it only lasts for so long. Like, even jumping back in, I was like, I kind of want to make a cool base thing, and, like, I still want to do that at some point, but, like, I only see me spending about 10 hours with this thing until, like, the next big thing drops. 
we we should we should try to to get a, a co-op session but like one good co-op session and yeah where i'm not still in the tutorial and you're just walking around me as i do minute shit yeah but like i don't i, don't, I mean i think you could probably just if you were to jump into my game, you would just jump to where I am. So that probably, yeah. Or we could just start like a, a new file and do a co-op tutorial together. Yeah. I think, I think probably, well, we'll talk about it, but, but I think we should give it a shot. Yeah. Um, but that's that. I watched a couple TV shows. Um, Castle Rock is a new show on Hulu. Which uh, I wanted it's... to get around to for this podcast and I didn't. Yeah, it's it's fine. Only three episodes are out right now, and it's going to be released weekly. Um, it's not by Stephen King, but it's based on his works and his world. I thought he had. I think he's a. I think he's like a consultant. You know, okay, like okay, like he's okay. there because but... I wanted because like he talked about that like he was on it to some degree. <laughs> yeah, so... I, I think he's involved, but he didn't make it. Yeah, he didn't write it. You know, it ain't no storm of the fucking century. No. Uh, but, uh, yeah, produced by J.J. Abrams, so there's some talent there. Uh, written and directed by a bunch of people I don't know. Um, it is very clearly in love with Stephen King, and it wants to be a Stephen King story. Uh, and I'm kind of interested. I wouldn't say it's it hasn't, like, wowed me to the floor yet, but after three episodes, I'm like, yeah, that's interesting. I want to keep watching this. Um, honestly, we'll probably... If if not next swath, but maybe when the first season is finished, we'll we'll probably talk about it. Yeah, we'll do a, a big spoiler cast. I believe it's trying to be an anthology show, so like I think the season one story will wrap up with season one, is what I think. Okay, so that's probably for the best. I also after a joke, after a joke, and I swear it was a joke, I started rewatching Doctor Who. Damn, that's what that's been about. Yeah, so. This back fucking in, guy. Back in on Doctor Who. Ah. I swear it was a joke. I swear Oof. it was a joke. Get, but I'm back in. Get your fucking egg beater hands off of me. <laughs> Exterminate. <laughs> oh. I will not be talking about Doctor Who on this podcast. Do not worry. Thank you. <laughs> I did, however, watch season one of My Hero Academia. So did I. <laughs> That's the segue noise. I thought you were trying to do like a, a noise from one of the characters in the show, and I'm like, <laughs> who has wind power? Are, are you trying? <laughs> uh, um, Zach, I teared yeah. up at episode one of My Hero Academia, and I did not expect that. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So I knew of this thing forever, and like I knew it was a thing that like people were like oh you should watch not gonna lie like and i still felt this all the way through the first season and like a little bit from what i'm into season two like i not gonna lie i i should probably restart season two because i took a, a break um something about the art style just didn't gel with me um yeah and like it, i was just like yeah i guess i'll get to it at some point um and then like too many people who like i just really like liked a lot like in terms of like opinions about shit like a lot of the waypoint people like got really into it and like i don't know just like a bunch of my friends got into it like there's a point where it's like okay i probably would like this like it, too many people says it's say it's good or whatever uh and i just kind of started it on a way i think did i start it before you yes okay so i kind of started it on a whim and i did not expect for like the um the whole like setup with like everyone in this world except for you pretty much is special and fuck you ch toddler you're never going to accomplish accomplish your dream it's impossible and it's just like holy shit um and that like affected me on a personal level for reasons more than i ever anticipated and it was incredible and i just kind of like kept watching it and it was like damn okay this is great um that is I had a Force Awakenings thing with this show, and my my cable's getting tugged, so hold on, I'm gonna try not disconnecting my mic as I continue talking and freeing this wire cable. Um, wire tangle, rather. So, I 
had a Force Awakens thing with this, where I was like, man, I'm so happy the kids growing up today get to start with this, because it's actually good. <laughs> um, because, much like how I grew up with the Star Wars prequels, and then you look back like, oh, I grew up with Dragon Ball, which I still like and will say is a good show, but looking back, it's like, oh man, this is really goofy <laughs> you know like there's the point i think a lot of people have where they're like man fuck dragon ball and then they think about it really hard they're like no this is still awesome but we have to yeah. it. it's like the wrestling thing which i've never <laughs> had but all right i small not a tangent but on that note i feel like there's something that people do where when they're away from something that they liked a lot a, a few years ago they get like a perspective on it where they realize oh that's actually really dumb and garbage yeah but if they go back in, they're back in. Yeah. And I think that happened to a lot of people with Dragon Ball when Fighters came out. And it's kind of what's happening with me and Doctor Who right now. Hell yeah. Anyway, continue. <laughs> so, man, I was back in on Resurrection F, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know what? You're, you're right. Those movies is when that happened, not Fighters. My favorite... So, Zach... Did you, Resurrection F came out around the same time as BVS, and I and did you know <laughs> that like comparatively that was such a box office success that actually that was like a thing that and like analysis people were pointing to that's like is this gonna be the next big trend after superheroes? <laughs> and hey, they might be right because fucking Ghost in the Shell and the Lead are a thing, but whatever. Those were in production way before that happened. Um, but. Uh, so yeah, Dragon Ball, like that. Anyways, so then you have the second generation of shows after that, which people refer to as the three or whatever the fuck, which is Bleach, Naruto, One Piece. Uh, I dabbled in One Piece, never really was my thing. I mean, obviously we got, like, the severely butchered, like, four kids version of it, and, like, I watched it, and I was like, yeah, whatever, I didn't, I never, I never really felt any connection to any of the main cast or, like, anything going on in that show, um, though, looking back and just general consensus, um, even though it's still going today and it's bloated to all hell and apparently they could, uh, they confirmed that, like, it's 80% done finally after, like, 15 fucking years, that seems to be the one everyone latches onto, like, okay, this remains consistently good, at least. Naruto and Bleach had a lot of promise and, like, immediately shat all over that, like, after so many arcs. Um, yeah, I never watched any of those three. Yeah, man. I, I've I've made my thing with Shonen known on here before. I think like it's it's generally not my thing, which is kind of why I was afraid to go into the show. Honestly. So here's the thing. My Hero Academia is good Naruto. <laughs> okay. That's what this show is. It and so I will say my opinion is partially informed already because the one thing because like I said like a bunch of the waypoint people liked it more specifically Danica who is like my social media management inspiration she's really great she used to run the waypoint thing now I think she's running the Twitter account for that dragon print show or whatever um and she used to work she used to run Crunchyroll's like stuff I think was her previous job she, she was at Crunchyroll for something or other uh, so she she tends to have a lot of, like, really good, interesting takes on shows, and she had a podcast where she was talking about My Hero Academia, and she basically talked about it as, like, this is looking at the, the last, like, this is the start of the third generation, where it's looking at all of the fuck-ups that Bleach and Naruto did, and it's going, okay, how can we make this not, like, how can we make this work? And that was like, huh, I kind of want to give this a try, and that is that is what that show is. It is looking at all of the fuck-ups they did. All of the terrible pacing, all of the, like, hypocritical shit with the characters and the themes. Okay, I, I, I'm just gonna start this real off. Naruto is just show is about, is, is about an outcast child who wears orange and is obnoxious as fuck. Uh, and his whole thing is that he's kind of a shitty kid and he's not very good at being, the, like, a ninja or whatever. But he wants to become the ninja president. And he's gonna work really hard at becoming the ninja president. That is immediately undermined when, like... The fact that he has a giant demonic fox entity that's, like, the most powerful thing in that universe, like, given to him at birth against his will, and he continuously relies on the power of that demon fox that he didn't work hard to achieve, like, he just, he, he, he basically is just better at everything by default. He just doesn't know it yet. Yeah. 
And kind of the same thing with Dragon Ball after a bit, where as soon as you hit Z and you realize, oh, he's just a, a really good alien fighter. And after a point, you don't matter unless you're a really good alien fighter. <laughs> Starts to can, work against the hard work ethic thing of that show. What are you saying? Can, can, can we say, uh, moving forward, that we're going to have open spoilers for season one of My Hero Academia? Yes. Because I want to talk about season one of My Hero Academia, but I haven't moved past season one. Okay. And, I mean, I'm just a little bit ahead of you, I, so we're okay. good. So, if, if, hey, if you guys want to watch My Hero Academia, maybe tap out here. Yeah, yeah. And watch season one and then come back. And, as always, timestamp in the description. Um, yeah. And also, too, I don't fucking care, this is well known at this point, fucking goddamn Naruto goes so far as that near the end of the series, they reveal that he's actually, like a reincarnation of one of the, like, of, like, the Kane and Abel analog of that world. <laughs> like, it's so fucking gar- Like, they do everything they can to be, like, this person was set up to be a godlike entity from the beginning. And it's like, fuck you, he's not working hard at all. He's just yeah, good. The chosen one. Yeah. Um, Bleach had the opposite problem, where that main character sucks, and there's nothing interesting about him at all. Um, no, he's got a bear, though. <laughs> yeah, the the other cast members are what made the good parts of Bleach good, and by good part I mean like the first two arcs and nothing else. Um, I've been kind of in a mood to go back and rewatch those, and I'm sure they have not held up at all. But still, <laughs> um, I have fond memories of that as like fucking whenever the fuck that was early two thousands. I actually stand corrected. I I think I read the first couple volumes of Bleach because my friend had them. Mm-hmm. Because I, I, I know that I, I, I read the first few volumes of the manga. And also, I think that that series is weird because it starts off a lot more episodic than people talk about. And I I actually sometimes wonder if that show was meant to go the Dragon Ball route. Because I think yeah. there's legitimately an alternate world where that's just like a, oh, read the chapter where they solve this demon case. like Kind of like a supernatural Doctor who type thing, you know? Yeah. And then, like, it eventually just became huge arcs and, like, sagas and shit. Um... Which, I, to be fair, I, I prefer uh, I prefer narratives to episodic stuff. I, I do, too. Um... But I understand that Bleach didn't do it well. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, it didn't really do neither. Like, the episodic stuff is fine. It's just really generic. Like, oh, a guy with big sword and spiky hair fights demons in urban Tokyo. Yeah. Um... But, yeah. Uh... So yeah, My Hero Academia has a main character who is just the most lovable motherfucker. And mm -hmm. he 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 earns everything that he accomplishes in that series up until this point I'm watching. Okay, so I was really, really nervous at first about how this was going to go. Okay. Because when they... Just to get it out of the way, he gets a power. Yeah. And I thought that, like, oh man, that's... That's kind of like a complete betrayal of your premise. Yeah. But he gets I, it by proving that he's worth it. Yeah, and even once he has the power, it's like, you're gonna have to work so much harder than anyone else to use this. Yeah. And that kind of balances that out. Which I also love because the premise of his power, first of all, his power, which is called One for All. So I know at some point, someone's gonna have a power that's all for one. <laughs> His that, rival, yeah. the rival or the, the bad final villain, the, yeah. yeah like that's gonna be a thing also i am not unconvinced that glowing baby from the start is not the final boss of that show i don't remember a glowing baby so at the very first episode and it's a very it's a very split second thing they're introducing the concept of quirks and they go one day a baby was born that was glowing and no one knew what the fuck that was about and after that birth quirks just started Ha like happening like more oh and more. yeah the, the it, first quirk for, it, yeah. it, it, the first quirk was just oh you glow and everyone else got quirks yeah yeah i am not unconvinced that care that that baby i guarantee not really guarantee but i have a strong feeling it will be important to the plot because that'd be fun and stupid yeah um oh no yeah but like i i love the the whole like you're not good enough for your power, so every time you use it, you mangle your body thing? Yeah. Because every fight is like, okay, I can jump once really good and punch maybe three times if I do it right with my fingers. <laughs> like, yeah. it's really good. <laughs> it's like One Punch Man if it was actually good. Yeah. 
Whoa. Hey, no, I'm gonna agree with you. One Punch Man is the most okay fucking shit in the world. It has some cool fight <laughs> scenes, but, like, that premise lasts maybe four episodes until it gets really yeah. fucking stale. Mob Psycho 100, way better. But this, where he's he's got the one punch, and, you know, he's got the one punch, you know? Like, yeah. That's way more interesting than I can destroy everything in one punch. Yeah. Use it well. Yeah. Um. So, yeah. Um. No, honestly, that's, like, my main thing with the show, is I, I legitimately find, that, like, his... The motivational aspect of, okay, how am I going to face this next challenge super cool? Um, yeah. And also just, like, this perfects that, like, okay, we have a huge shonen cast of side characters, and they all gotta have something interesting going on. And the powers are really w well thought out. And even if the powers are, like, maybe not the most exciting thing, they they at least have fun with the character who has them personality-wise. Like, the dude who shoots out, a like, a belly button laser, like, he, he just shoots out a laser. Like, that's not a great power or anything, but, yeah. like, he's a, he's a, he's fun comedy relief. Um, the dude who sh just shocks people is just kind of a fun dude. <laughs> like, yeah. boring power, but fun person, and I think that's great. And Bakugo is a really good rival character. Yeah, I like Bakugo. Yeah. Uh, there's a bunch of characters that I want to learn more about. Like, I want to learn more about the Birdman. Yeah, you don't see anything about Birdman Season 1, and I was really bummed, because he seems yeah. cool, and I still don't really get what his power is. Yeah, same. Um, unfortunately, just because of social osmosis, I know that we're gonna see a lot m more of Dumb Pervert Kid, but... Yeah, I, 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 I know about him. I found out about him because of Nick Robinson. <laughs> <Oof>. <laughs> Do you know about that? No. So, after Nick Robinson... Ref okay, I should probably recap this story so people... <laughs> Chances are, if you're listening to this, you know about the Nick Robinson thing, but I'm going to recap because there's some... You know what? Actually, I'm not even going to say that because we still get the messages that are like, I don't even like video games, but I listen to your podcast, which I still don't get, but still. Not, not to devalue those listeners. I still love you. I just don't see see the value in us. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I don't see the value in us if you do like it. Yeah, yeah, honestly, we just turned this podcast off for garbage. Um, no, anyways. So, they, uh, Nick Robinson was a creep, did a lot of, like, sexual predatory things that you can find all about if you look it up. Uh, he got fired from Polygon, and he just took a break from social media, and everyone just assumed, oh, he left social media, good, he's a creep. And then he came back and was just like, yeah, I have a YouTube channel. And, like, just, like, acted like everything was hunky-dory and fine, which is like, eh. Um, he's still clinging on to whatever fan base he has left. Uh, and there was a day where, um, and, like, I, I only, I think Trick told me about this, because I, I've had Nick Robinson blocked forever, but, like, um people were giving him shit because he posted a meme that had Minata in it. And th all the replies were just like, yeah, you would fucking like that character. Like, <laughs> just the most you fucking... You don't see the irony in this, you piece of shit. Like, uh... uh so that's how I found out who that character was, so it was really weird watching the... <laughs> the, 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 like, shipwreck fight scene. Yeah. Because the whole time I'm like, oh, that's the Nick Robinson character. <laughs> Oh no! Yeah. Uh, yeah, but the show is good. I like it a lot. Um, I do want to say, like, I'm so like nervous getting into a shonen thing because I know this is still ongoing. There's gonna be a lot of story that doesn't go anywhere. It's gonna be ten years from now. We're still not gonna have answers to anything, you know? Yeah. But the one thing I will say is that I really like this show's attempt to go all in on the emotions. Yeah. I like emotions. And man, this is a shonen where there's some emotions. Yeah. There, hey, those first, like, three or four episodes, that made character cries a lot. Oh, dude. <laughs> and you know what? I was right there with them. That's a Naruto thing. Well, okay, that second part isn't a Naruto thing, but the yeah. crying a lot is a Naruto thing. <laughs> so... I was I was getting a little emotionally invested, you know. Yeah. And I had a realization, and I I know I okay. I'm like I said, I see season one. I don't know if this has happened yet. Maybe it did, maybe it didn't. But there will be a part in this show where this character shows up to saves the day, 
and says the don't worry, I'm here now thing. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm gonna cry like a fucking baby. <laughs> um there's a lot that I just respect a lot. And I think this is more like, oh hey, just because I I wa- I grew up and like into teenage years watched all this fucking bullshit. Um, right off the bat, they tell you, by the way, this is the story about how I became the best hero. Like, yeah. they respect you enough to know, you fucking know that the main character is yeah, going to accomplish the dream at the end. We're just going to tell you up front, just enjoy the no, ride. And, and that's good, because it sets the tone, because yeah. you know it's coming. Yeah. Through thick and thin, because there's going to be, like, a, there's going to be a season that ends real bad. Like, there's, al- there's yeah. always got to be one of those, you know? Um, but you know it's coming. Um... Oops. Also, just the pace of it, like, they've covered so much ground of the traditional, like, archetypal, like, storytelling beat that, nor- like, normally for other shows, it's like, oh, we're at episode 40. Like, season one covers a lot of ground, and I respect that a lot. Like, they don't waste your fucking time. Fight scenes are fast. They feel good because of that. I never feel, like, bored or, like, okay, let's get on with it. They they keep a good pace, which I, I like a lot. Yeah. Um Though that being said, there were other shows that have been like that, and then, oh no, we ran out of manga, oops. <laughs> but they seem to be deliberately pacing the seasons so that that isn't a problem for a while yet? Yeah, that that was more of an issue back when, like, shonen animes didn't have breaks. You, yeah, shonen they literally were every, time. like, every week, every day, like, every week of the year <laughs> there was yeah. an episode. And, 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 like, with shows like this, it's more like, no, 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 when there's more show, we'll make the next season. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah. Um, that being, so I do know, recently in the manga, um, there's been some kerfuffle. Don't know how much you know about the Endeavor thing. I don't know anything. Uh, so apparently he's a character who shows up, um, later, and he's, like, a wife-beater man. And oh. And apparently, in the manga, as of late, they're kind of, like trapezing around like oh maybe they're gonna like she forgives him he for like he apologizes and maybe they get back together thing and that's been very very polarizing within the fandom um you don't say yeah um between the line of like i don't think this should be in the dumb shonen show to i don't think that character in any situation like that deserves forgiveness um yeah, so that's something that I'm shifty-eyed looking at from the distance because um, that doesn't sound great. Um, but also, if it's not a big part of the story, I can at least kind of ignore it, but that's kind of hopefully not a terrible yeah. gross thing. <laughs> well, I will say one thing, and not to dwell on this too much, but I did come to the conclusion that My Hair Academia is one of those things that right now it's just too popular to criticize. Oh. Did you see what happened on Twitter? Uh vaguely? Yeah, I think you I think you responded to it to it at one point. Yeah. I I just I, I made some tweets just like, oh, you know what? I have some issues with the setting of My Hero Academia and how it portrays some of this stuff. Um boy, was that a mistake, because I wasn't taking those criticisms very seriously, but for like two days straight I got people and good people, people I like, just people that like every single person was like actually you're wrong because really it's and i'm um, all right <laughs> so i i'm not gonna criticize my hero academia on twitter anymore oh no. now to be fair i think that's maybe one of those things where like i don't think people are watching this for the setting and i think it's just the thing that a lot of people didn't even consider up till this point you know and that's fine <laughs> it wasn't like i wasn't saying the show was bad i was just yeah. saying here's something that i didn't care for crazy about and uh no uh, i got conflicting reports about like everyone had a different reason for why it wasn't an issue you know so because i was thinking about this because i i actually did remember it before we started i was like oh yeah i wonder if, if like the study thing is going to come up yeah i almost wonder if it would be like kind of like the thing where like you ever hear those complaints about, like, oh, the fact that the Sands are on Earth doesn't matter in Dragon Ball at all? Like, the show just doesn't deal with it? Like, it's only interested in the central cast? I uh... almost wonder if it's one of those things. Where it's like, yeah, that is, like, a weird narrative foible, but also, like, the show doesn't care. <laughs> and, like, yeah, of course. Yeah. 
No, I know the show doesn't care. That was my point. Yeah. The only thing I w- the only thing I was saying was like, hey, it's kind of funny how like they set up the setting like this to fit the narrative, but if you think outside of the narrative, it doesn't make a lot of sense. That's yeah. all I was saying. <laughs> yeah. Oh well. That no, it's fun. just funny because that happened right after I was like attacked by uh Falcom fans. Yeah, Falcom fans. Because I dared to say Trails of Cold Steel is kind of not the best thing. <laughs> Every time I feel like maybe I want to try out one of these Falcom games. Like, I have a bad Twitter experience with one of those fucking cultists that are like, clearly don't do anything other than play Falcom games and then search on Twitter. First, okay, I'm going to say something real quick here for, for people listening. If you spend your free time looking up <laughs> terms on Twitter to talk to random strangers about them and accost them about their opinions about random things. One, stop. And two, I don't know how else to put this. You need to find some fucking friends because that's <laughs> not okay. Like, that's just, don't. The strangers yeah. don't care. You know, <laughs> just... like, it's one of the things where, like, if you're searching for your favorite series on Twitter, and you see someone saying, hey, I just started this series. Who wants to talk about it? Go. Yeah. Go. But if you're seeing someone going, yeah, I didn't really like this, and your immediate response is, you fuck it up. Yeah. Okay, so you know what? Actually, I will say, I'm, g- I'm going to call myself out for a second here. Because I, I just search WAF all the time. I, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I did recently tweet out, like, hey... I, like, I really want to give kaiju stuff more of a chance, but, like, I only really like Shin Godzilla and the original Godzilla from what I've seen and everything else I've just kind of bounced off of. And there was a dude who didn't follow me, and I don't think anyone retweeted that, so he must have just been name searching, like, term searching. And he was like, hey, here's some stuff to check out. And I didn't mind that. Like, that's clearly, like... Hey, yeah, I'm looking. That's, that's using the tools of the platform. Like, hey, I'm looking for recommendations, and it's like, oh, I don't follow you, but like, here's some here's some cool stuff from someone who's way into this shit or whatever. And I'm like, you know what? That's yeah. that's fine. But like, if you're getting if you're term searching to like fucking like be like, well, actually, fucker, yeah, the, yeah. like, and, fuck hey, off. If you're ever <laughs> starting with well, actually, just, just delete stop. The tweet. <laughs> uh, oh my god, yeah. That's no, terrible. Man, I want to... Oh, I, I, I haven't watched My Hero Academia in a bit now, and just talking about it makes me want to jump back in. It's a really good yeah, show. Yeah, I kind of I kind of want to start on that season two. Season two is way longer, by the way. I don't know if you saw that. Oh, uh, yeah, I did. I did. Yeah. Oh, this is kind of a random side thing, but, like, Right Stuff had a really good Gundam Blu-ray sale. So, like, I think I'm going to start rewatching Double Zeta again, which I think is actually the longest it has taken me to watch a TV program. Nice. I started it in college. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's, mm, I don't know. I'm, I I guess I just need to get to the second half. People say is better, but still not that great. Shit, I forgot. I, I got to get on the, the last episode of Origin. Hell yeah. I totally forgot about it. You should you should do it. Well, didn't didn't you not watch the second to last either? Yeah, yeah, I've I've, I've been waiting. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Honestly, they they like one kind of ends, and then the the next episode picks up immediately right where it ends. So yeah, yeah. it's better watch two together. It's it's fun. It still has some of those um prequel things. Yeah. yeah. Um. I, I need not gonna lie. I I've been interested in picking up the the manga releases of that because I have the first one and like it's really damn good and like not gonna lie, probably the best like hardcover manga thing I've ever bought. It's just really quality. Um, but they're like twenty bucks each, and I just mm, you know <laughs> like yeah expensive. Uh, and I need to buy eleven more of them, so that heads up. Uh, but yeah, I'll get around to that eventually. I um. Yeah. The Gundam mood never goes away for me. Oh, I started reading the Thunderbolt manga, actually. Hmm. Uh, they cut everything from that that you would anticipate that they would cut from a stream- more streamlined a- adaption. Yeah. Like, the characters are a little bit more fleshed out. But, uh... Yeah, no. The Honestly, like, I, I still probably would recommend the, like, movie version of it. So, <laughs> yeah. That's been a thing. 
So, speaking of things. Yeah. Swamp Thing will be featured in the new DC streaming service. Uh, speaking of superhero... Oh, fuck, how do I salvage? Spe- DC is the opposite of Marvel in that they make bad things. Fuck Ant-Man! <laughs> Damn. No, I I made... I, I, I... Wait, no, did I say DC is the... Whatever. DC makes the bad things, I like the Marvel things. I think I worded that bad. But whatever. Um, fuck Batman! Fuck Batman, yeah. Oh, fuck, yeah, that was... That's what you were saying when you said fuck Ant-Man. Oh. Oh, oh, Rosin. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man, Titans looks garbage. I can't wait to watch that. Um, okay, I'm not, okay, not gonna lie. I feel really weird about that whole DC streaming service thing because it looks <laughs> terrible, like, video content-wise. And the thing that even their own website seems to, like, throw under the rug is, like, yeah, you get access to, like, a shit ton of our old backlog of comics from about 100 years worth of history. Yeah. And it's like, I feel like that should be the main draw, maybe. No, please watch our <laughs> Titan show. <laughs> God, that looks bad. Dude, like, just the image of Robin shooting and slicing the throat of a bunch of thugs and then covered in blood going, fuck, fuck Batman. Batman. <laughs> like, how... How do you still not get it? <laughs> it's How are you still doing this? My favorite thing, though, is it seems like Cyborg just won't be in there because that's too hard. Of course, Cyborg it's won't too... be in there. How the fuck are they going to do Beast Boy? Because, mm. well, like, Starf- Star- Starfire and Raven, it's easy because, like, you just do, like, magical, like, blasts and stuff. Yeah. Beast Boy and Cyborg are problems. <laughs> no, you 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 are totally wrong as to why Cyborg's not going to be in that show. Oh, because he's an adult now, because he's in the Justice League. Yeah, because he's in Justice League. Yeah. And it's not because he's an adult now. It's because DC has made it well known that you don't get to touch the stuff from the movies when you're making a TV show. Oh, yeah, because they... they... The, like, they, they deleted the Suicide Squad from the CW universe, right? Yeah, they made them kill them off. That's incredible. And they didn't, they weren't allowed to call the Joker Joker on Gotham. Oh my god. That's so fucking dumb. I know, it's so great. Well, when we all see Pennyworth. Yeah. If they're making an Alfred TV series, that's the worst idea. Are you serious? Yeah, it's called Pennyworth. You don't know about this? Oh, I don't know. It's made, apparently it's going to be made by some of the Gotham people, but it's also not a Gotham show. We're in the... <laughs> Is it, aren't the Gotham people making a Superman prequel? I think so. Stop! <laughs> Stop! <laughs> Dude, it hurt. Because I've said this before. I don't care about Marvel. I love DC. I care so much about DC. And DC is the one that gets all the bad stuff. Yeah. And Marvel has all the good stuff. Yeah. Just give me one. Just give me one. <laughs> Uh, nah, Sh- Shazam wants Wonder Woman too. Shazam will win an Oscar. Uh, Shazam looks like if I was a kid, I would like it. Yeah, yeah. I think th- here's my honest to god thing. So like they keep announcing TV shows and movies and then backpedaling and then making some of them but not making all of them and doing whatever. And now they're fracture like they're fracturing their fucking movie thing where they're like, "Oh yeah, uh, it's just worlds of DC now. Sometimes they count, sometimes they don't," which I'm going to be real is going to confuse the fuck out of the average moviegoer. Yeah. Um but also just like the fact that they were like someone at DC was like, "Yeah, we're going to greenlight three different Joker movies." What? I only know about one. There, There's at least two that are still alive, and there was a third one that was, like, confirmed at some point, but nobody's talked about ever since. So, so the Joker movie that I know about, I had just assumed it was gonna be the Jared Leto Joker, but it's not, apparently. So one of them was supposed to be the Jared Letter, Let, Letter, <laughs> the Jared oh. Letter Joker, but there was supposed to be an out-of-continuity one that was just, like, a different one or something. Oh no. That but like to be fair, I think they also confirmed like, oh, we're gonna space these out so it's not like they don't like it's not too soon. But like they were already like, yeah, this won't be in the DCEU, which is fucking yeah. weird. It it I don't know, it's been a mess. And like they they've had like a bunch of different shit like TV series and like movies that they're like, yeah, this is happening and then backpedaling. Yeah. Well, it's almost like they put all their chips in a 
fucking rotten, dirty basket. Yeah. And now they're trying desperately to salvage some of the chips. Just fucking reboot. Take, like, two years off and just do it again. But do it you right. You can't. You can't reboot at this point. It's too soon. <sighs> the only way to do it is to make stuff not related and hope one of them's a hit. I guess. Oh, man. I hope that Swamp Thing show is good because apparently it has good people attached and I like Swamp Thing. But... I have the weirdest fucking DC thing where, like, I... I have more attachment to Vertigo than I do DC. <laughs> uh, nice. Honestly, my thing with DC and, like, Superman and Batman, I feel like the idea of a Superman and Batman movie right now is poisoned. Yeah. But I would actually go all in if they made a good Batman TV show. Like, we're beating around the bush with all this bullshit. Just make a Batman TV show. Yeah. Just just Batman fighting fucking crime every week. Like, just do it. You know, so, um... I've actually had a, quite a few friends that, like, since they're, like, you know, I have the people trying to help me get into the comic thing still. Uh, numerous people that don't know each other have recommended, like, the latest Batman stuff to me. Like, Yeah, I've heard it's good. I've been too out of the loop, honestly. Uh, I know that there's a weird, like, Catwoman Batman wedding thing that people got mad about for some reason. But, like, other than that, like, a bunch of people that I... No, we're like, you should read this because, like, apparently there's really cool stuff with Bane in there that's really fun and just a mm. bunch of other stuff. So I was like, oh, maybe I'll pick that up. I don't know. But yeah. Um, what what were we talking about again? Fuck it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was our DC talk. Um, so I saw Ant-Man and the Wasp, uh, as you all know from my embarrassing Broly incident. Um... I like it better than the first, still probably on the lower batch of Marvel movies for me. They do the father-daughter thing a lot better this time, and not gonna lie, I think part of it is because that kid actor is the same one, and she's older now, and she's able to have better dialogue. <laughs> um, the villain is probably the weakest of their attempt to, like, oh shit, we need to have sympathetic, interesting villains that aren't just, like, our hero but bad. Um... Lawrence Fishburne's in it, and he's cool. Um, they rescue, and I don't, do you care about spoilers? It's the most obvious spoiler in the thing. Uh, I'm probably never going to watch this movie. I'm almost entirely tapped out of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Okay. Um, they rescue uh, the Wasp's mom, Hank Pym's wife, because she was stuck in the Quantum Realm. Uh, but it... Like, you don't really get to know her at all. Like, that's just kind of a plot thing, and she's, like, around a little bit, and she's like, oh, I'm so proud of you, daughter. Um, but that, like, reveals, like, a bigger problem with that movie. That movie should not have been called Ant-Man and the Wasp. No. Because the Wasp is in it. She has... Her character thing in that movie is... Oh, yay, my mom's back. <laughs> like, that's about it. And she fights people. Like, th that's all that that is. And she has, she has a more active role... But I I expect a character arc and growth to the level of Ant-Man in a movie titled Ant-Man and the Wasp, and I think she got the short end of the stick, and that sucks. More SJW pandering once again. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like the opposite. I just... SJWs are so happy that the cis white male boring white bread main character got better character development than the interesting woman, yes. Yeah. Uh, no, um, fucking... Okay, so you know how you had your Black Panther thing with, like, the final fight? My my Black Panther thing? Yeah, where you're, like, the, the suits aren't working like they did in the previous part of the movie or whatever. Yes, yes, yes. So I've rewatched that movie, and I, I still don't have that but i do have an equivalent for ant-man and the wasp okay so and and to be fair this was not even an observation someone at the theater so i haven't had this in a good while but there's a point where like the villain uh who also looks like a destiny 2 player character um sh her thing is that she's kind of like halfway stuck out of reality so she like continuously phases in and out of existence and she needs the energy of like the Hank Pym wife, wasp mother. I forget her name. Okay. The, the law. Hank Pym wife, wife, wasp mother. Yeah. Hank Pym wife, wasp mother. Um, 
I I don't remember. See that like that's how much she's in that movie though. Yeah. Like she, that's it's all fine. she is. She is something it's to fine. be rescued out of the realm, and that's it. Um, she needs the energy from her so that she can exist within our reality all the time again, or else she's just eventually gonna fade away into nothingness. So actually, like you feel really bad for her, and also. Because of, like, a Hank Pym fuck-up, she is the way she is, so it's kind of like, hey, you made me like this, in a very kind of convoluted roundabout way, but, like, your fuck-up is responsible for me slowly dying, and, like, she makes it clear, like, when she phases out of reality, nothing can hurt her, but just the act of phasing out of reality hurts a lot. Um, so she has this evil supervillain suit that helps her control her phasing better? But when she's out of the suit, it's hard for her to control, and she gets tired really easily, and she has a special chamber that, like, takes the pain away and lets her, like, sleep and live normally. Um, there's a point where she has everyone captured, and she's out of the suit, and another person's there, who I won't say because spoilers. Um, and they they do, like, a ha-ha, we gotcha, and they, they escape. But they manage to knock both of the bad guys down, including the ghost lady. Um, and her suit is, like, right there in the other room. And a guy from the back of the movie theater started yelling, Take the suit! Take the suit! And I was like, man, fuck this guy. And then I started to think about it. I'm like, wait, why the fuck aren't they taking the suit? Why the fuck aren't they taking the suit? The problem's solved! <laughs> And uh, they didn't take the suit. And I was kind of like, oh, okay, that's a little goofy, but whatever. Maybe they were just yeah. in a hurry. Uh, Shout-outs to random obnoxious movie theater people. Yeah. <sighs> that's my girl! Is that a fucking Heaven's Feel reference? Hell yeah, it is. Oh, God. When's the second one of those dropping? January! Oh, uh, <sighs> damn. Can't wait to see Noidia again. What? No idea. No idea. Yeah. Oh, it's okay. True off fans remember. I watched bad subs, and there was a point where Archer said no idea, oh, but it was, yes, but right. it displayed okay, as okay. no idea. Yeah, no idea, right? <laughs> no idea. Well, I mean, unless you go to the movie theater, you're probably waiting a lot longer than yeah, January. That, yeah, that's true. That's true. That is true. But I'm probably gonna go to the theater for all those. Gonna be real awkward when the sex happens, but you know. <laughs> Oof. Yeah. Um. Speaking of the sex happening, yeah, I, I've I've been in kind of a pulp mood, Zach, like just pulpy shit mood, and I kind of blame Devilman for this tangentially. Uh, I <laughs> I I got the Devilman uh, like classic collection volume one. It's a two volume thing. The second volume's coming out in October. Um, yeah. I don't feel the need to talk yeah. about that here, other than it's put me in the mood for more pulpy shit. I, I'm pretty sure you have talked about it here. Uh, the manga? Yeah. Oh, maybe I did. Uh, I'll talk about it more when that second volume comes up, and I can talk about it, like, as a whole, or whatever. Um, Hitler shows up in that first classic collection, it's kind of weird. Um... Yeah, you totally talked about this. Okay, 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 then, yeah. Uh, but, uh, I've got, I've been in the mood for dumb, pulpy old shit from before I was born. Yeah. So, I... <laughs> I actually don't... When did Escape from New York... Yeah, Escape from New York was way before I was born. Um, I decided to rewatch Escape from New York, which I probably haven't seen since I was, like, 11 or something. That is a bad movie that I like a lot. Nice. <laughs> like, I don't know how this has become, like, herald heralded as, like, a cla like cult classic dystopian sci-fi action movie. It's not very good. The action sucks. It's kind of meandery and boring, uh, there's a point where you can feel the script writers struggling because there's a point where the main character fails and there's literally nothing else that he can do to the point where there's a scene where the main character just walks down the street and then just sits down in a chair. And then something happens to, like, bring him back into the plot. Um, the fucking main theme sounds like it could be the theme of, like, a shitty budget DOS game. Uh, and, uh, boy... While this is a very, very room temperature take and observation, but man, did Kojima ask David Hayter to do a Kurt Russell impression from that movie for Metal Gear. <laughs> like, it's not even inspired. It is just no do that. Like, 
And I've, like, that's known, like, everyone knows that, but just watching it, it's like, holy shit. Like, this is just fucking David Hayter. Um, it's dumb, and I can't recommend it, but also, like, it's one of those, like, I watched this as a kid and I remember it being way cooler. Um, but also, I kind of got into the mood, because that movie takes place in, like, so the basic plot of Escape from New York is that New York has become the prison island of the United States, and the president's plane crashes there. And and someone's gotta go in and rescue the president. And that's gonna be none other than Snake Plissken. Yes. Yeah. Um, but it, it it very clearly takes place in like an America where it's like the apocalypse hasn't happened yet, but it's about to or it's happening. Like everything just sucks. Uh, and I kind of was in a very specific mood for that, so I rewatched the first Mad Max. <laughs> yeah. Because there's, there's like, not a lot that scratches that particular itch. Where there's, like, there's still society... Like, if you wanted to go to an IHOP, you can do that. But, like, there's a, there's probably going to be a riot next Thursday, you know? Like, I was in the mood for that. And, and Mad Max has that. Um, which I feel like a lot of people don't actually know the first Mad Max movie well. Because everyone just knows Road <laughs> Warrior and Fury Road at this point. Yeah, yeah. the uh, A.K.A. the two good ones. Yeah. Well, Mad Max, I don't have nope. it in me to say is a bad movie. I, I, hey, I can. I, I, I don't see, I think that is a fine film, but it, it's hard to say it's anything better than fine. <laughs> I still found the car chases really exciting. I love that the fucking guy that calls himself Knight Rider is like a thing that you just say unironically. It is the most, like, oh, God, it's, was that 70s? I think it was 70s. Like, I don't know. I think it was 70s. But, like, the most 70s were trying our best to make these fucking action scenes the coolest thing possible. And, like, boy, do a lot of them not age well. And, boy, was it out of budget. But there's some cool metal shit in there. It's kind of fucked up when you see his wife and baby get run over, though. That's not great. Oh, also, okay, hold on. That's the thing I realized that I've never noticed at any other, like, time I've seen this movie. Which this is probably, like, the third time I've seen this movie. So, Max's wife and baby get run over by, like, the gang near the end of the movie. And in the hospital scene afterwards, the doctor tells Max, Oh, your wife is gonna be fine, but your son died. The wife lived! Where the fuck is she in those other movies? Uh, hey... There is very clearly a lot that happens quickly between one and two. <laughs> yeah, and to be fair, I have a feeling like if the apocalypse happens, those people working in the hospital ain't gonna be working there long. They're gonna get the fuck out. She probably got left behind in that process. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it it. I forgot how much of a cop movie that was. Like, I knew I remembered he was a cop, and like other cops showed up there. But like, that is a very clear like rogue cops versus outlaws where there's a point where the commissioner gordon type character just sees like a bad guy get away with some heinous shit and he's like all right boys i don't give a fuck anymore just do whatever you want just do the paperwork for it <laughs> um and yeah it's dumb and cheesy uh it gets really slow um around a middle point where there's a point where max is kind of like oh no a bunch of my friends have died and the boss is like, why don't you go take a vacation? And there's, like, ten minutes of, like, oh, yeah, we're driving around places and nothing's happening. And then, like, it ramps up and the final action sequence happens. But, yeah. I mean, Road Warrior and, like, Fury Road are a lot better. And Thunderdome is a shitty movie, but, like, it's fun in its own right. Um, but Mad Max, I, I still enjoyed. Uh, what are your thoughts on Mad Max? <laughs> I feel like I made them known. <laughs> yeah, it's fair. I, I I was never the biggest Mad Max fan. I liked two and four a bit. Yeah. I don't I don't like them as much as other people do, but they're fine. Oh, you don't like Fury Road? Okay, I actually didn't know that. No, yeah, Fury Road is four. Yeah. No, I I didn't I didn't know that. I I thought you were one of those like oh yeah, it's one of the greatest things ever people. No, no. I mean, okay. I, I enjoyed it, but I've only yeah. seen it once, and I thought it was just a it was it was good. Yeah. That's as far as I'll go with it. It's good. Yeah, you're not like that's okay. you're some, not. Some things can just be good. Yeah, you're not like one of those people like me who've seen that like five times and like watched the black and white version and shit. No, 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 no. Yeah, no. This, yeah, that's fair too. Also, I know that movie just like drags for a lot of people that like kind of zone out at the action stuff. 
I I've I have a few friends that that's a problem with that movie because that is literally just the longest chase scene in movie format ever. And I mean, I, I, I feel like I've said this before too, but like I enjoy a good action scene, but it's definitely not my, it's, it's not my favorite thing. I, I, I greatly prefer character drama. Yeah. Have you and seen, like, I, yeah, this is random. Yeah. Have you seen John wick? No. Oh, okay. I wonder how you'd feel about those. Cause like they're mostly action, but there's some character stuff. And like, I wonder how like, those would be because like it's it's more character driven than fury road definitely but like yeah it's still mostly choreography I, it's, I, it's funny like i've been i've been thinking about that hack a lot today because of uh, <laughs> recent things i don't know where that got me <laughs> wow <laughs> uh no you, you I, I i'm pretty sure you saw the tweet that they were like please stop asking us for more dot hack yeah yeah um, no so i just hey, i just like the I, I just like that someone said i've been thinking a lot about dot hack today in 2018 that's the it's just good <laughs> yeah, yeah no yeah so well yeah because i would think because hey dot hack is probably dead like last recode it, it's did it it's not off. sell well <laughs> i i don't think it sold as well as it needed to to bring that series back yeah that's a shame um but i was thinking about like yeah it, it's really hard to recommend dot hack sign to people because that is a show entirely of people standing around and talking to each other yeah and that's just not what a lot of people find fun yeah like people some people need the action and that's fine um i need people talking you know yeah what the fuck what uh-oh i don't know i heard a weird noise in my closet i heard a weird noise in your closet that's weird anyway oh my god the red dress (laughs) oh fuck (laughs) off uh uh that anyway so not in pulpy news but i'm gonna circle back around after this i continued on the brandon sanderson hype wagon so i think i noted last time that i i finished the the first book of the stormlight archive of which there are three books out and it's planned to be a 10 book series with like a time skip between book uh, five and six or whatever um and i got into the shit where it's like okay you can move on to stormlight archive book two or you can read this other book he wrote that's in the same universe on a different world in that universe if you want to learn about the backstory for a really cool sword that shows up at some point and i went fuck it I'm going to do the thing that I'm going to do that like in their thing where I'm going to do this. All in. Yeah. All in. I'm all in on this shit. So I started reading Warbreaker. In the first chapter, I know the sword <laughs> like straight up. There is a sword that shows up that is sentient and just murders things. If you touch it wrong, um, which I guess is a weirdly, really bad way to describe a sword. That's, all swords uh but i'm talking like the what the guy does is he'll leave it in an alleyway and then if a thief shows up and grabs it and tries to like unsheath the sword the sword will just find a way for that person to commit suicide and then he'll just go like locate the sword and be like oh yep shouldn't have grabbed that and then the dude walks away um and i'm like yep that's the sword that's shown up in the other stormlight archive book can't wait to see how that happens um so Warbreaker is, once again, different world, same universe as Stormlight Archive. Uh, and it is, you can see the magic system similarities already. Um, I think the big thing with all, like, the whole Cosmere, which is the meta name for the whole franchise or whatever, I think the big thing with their magic system is that it's very tied into the respiratory system. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what? What? Yeah. Like, of humans? Yeah. Like breathing? Yeah. Be- <laughs> so so here's the thing. Why is that so funny to me? I don't know, but That's the way you said that. Yeah, the magic system's really tied to the respiratory system. I don't know. I don't know how else to work breathing. It's really tied into breathing, I guess. I know, I get it. It just yeah. sounded really funny. I guess. Whatever floats whatever knocks your socks off. Um so in Stormlight um, there were, like, the currency of that world has Stormlight in it, and Stormlight is, like, this, like, light source mystical energy thing that just kind of is in places, and, like, when it storms out, it kind of fills the atmosphere, and, like, specialized crystals can contain it. But the magical people in that world, what they do when they want to use magic 
is they breathe in stormlight and then they hold their breath, which is like easier than it sounds because it's magical breath. And then as they do magical stuff, that breath slowly leaves their body and then they exhale and then it's done. Um, in this, uh, there's none of that, but what instead you have is that the main magic of this world seems to be breathing life into inanimate objects so that they act like miniature people and do shit for you. Um, like, the opening prologue thing of the book is a guy trying to, like, assassinate someone in a prison, and he, like, accomplishes this by, like, getting himself arrested but, like, they don't check his shit, and he has, like, a miniature, like, straw doll in, like, his pockets or something. And he, like, breathes life into the doll so that it can grab the keys and then, it, like, let him out or whatever. Um, and there's a lot of fun stuff with that. But I guess, like, more, like, there, there's a lot to cover here, but I'm not going to try to spend too much time on it. Uh, basic premise is that there's a kingdom to the north in the mountains. Uh, which is where our main character is from. And there's a giant evil empire to the south. And in the evil empire, it's run by a council of gods. But you very clearly find out that they're gods with a question mark at the end, because what they actually are is, in this world, sometimes when people die, and no one really knows the like logistics of it, it's just sometimes when people die, and some religious sects believe that, like, oh, if you're a really good person and you die, this happens... Uh, you can just randomly come back to life. And you have, like, a bit more magical energy than normal. Um, now, in other parts of the world, what happens is that that energy runs out and then you just die again. And people are just kind of like, oh, you're a weird zombie person. But in this empire, if that happens to you, people start to worship you as a god and you get your own temple and you get your own, like, space in this giant, like, capital city where, like, you get your own, like, building and shit dedicated to you, you get your own, like, religious following, uh, and they basically sacrifice the magical energy of, like, innocent peasants to keep those people alive. And, like, it doesn't kill you. Like, what happens is it's, like, a, a poor peasant family will volunteer their children to be, like, magical sacrifices to a god so that that god can continue living longer. Um, and those children, after they get the magical energy sucked out of them, will never be able to use magic ever again. But for, like, a lot of poor people, that's, like, a worthy trade-off because they're never gonna have a fucking use for that anyways. Um, but it's kind of, like, an uncomfortable thing. Um, so what happens is that this evil empire wants to take over the kingdom to the north because technically their bloodline is the true, like, original, uh, holders of that land, so they have a better claim on the throne of their whole empire than any of the gods do. So they're like, those people gotta go. Uh, through a bunch of dumb backstory war, like, bullshit, the king of the Northern Kingdom signed a contract peace treaty thing that was like, hey, when when my daughter turns 17, I will, I will send her over to the empire and she will marry uh, the highest god, like the, the god emperor king person or whatever, uh, and then she'll she'll have the baby for because when the god king like impregnates a woman, it's always a stillborn child. And then that baby immediately comes back to life again. And it's like, oh, like you got like an infinite loop of gods being born because it's always stillborn and then comes back to life. So the king's the, the daughter's 17th birthday is coming up and she has been preparing her whole life to get married off and like learn about this culture and, like, just accept that this is her lot in life. But it really sucks because everyone in the kingdom loves her, and she's a really good leader. She's really brave, really courageous, really kind. Like, she's kind of, like, typical, like, archetypical, like, Disney princess-style character, it seems like. Um, and the king, like, the, her birthday's coming around, and the king is like, fuck. Shit. So then he gets together, like, his like strategy people and they work out a loophole that all the paper says is when the daughter turns 17 the king will send over his daughter to be married but he didn't specify which daughter so he sends a younger one instead because he doesn't really like her that much <laughs> and he's just like well we can afford to lose you more than we can afford to lose her 
So he sends his shitty rebellious, like, daughter who, like, clearly was never loved as a child and, like, always was just a little shit and acted out. And she's just thrown into this world of, like, politics and god beings and intrigue. Um, and she's, like, freaking out about it. Um, but then she gets more interesting from there. And, like, it turns out the god king dude is actually not that bad of a guy. And he's actually kind of just, like, an immature kid. Like she is. And it turns out they get along well really nice. And they don't really, like... It, it seems like how it's going so far is like, yeah, we're going to try avoiding the whole, like, pregnancy thing because, like, eh. Um, and there's a lot of weird politics and intrigue going on behind the scenes. Uh, while this is all happening, the older daughter is kind of mad because she's like, what the fuck? Why did you send her? She is terrified and doesn't know what to do about this. You, like, groomed me my entire life to be basically a political pawn, and then you didn't use me. That's fucking bullshit you're a terrible father fuck you i'm gonna go rescue her and then take her place like it should have been so she like goes out to the city to try to rescue her sister um and yeah it's interesting so far it's it's clearly one of his earlier books uh once again this is the one that's available for free for download from his site the prose isn't as good and also sometimes i question him as an older man writing a teenage girl, actually multiple teenage girls, are viewpoint characters. Um, sometimes it's kind of like, yeah, that's a little suspect. I don't think that's how that character would be thinking right now. Um, just because, you know, he's writing as a dude or whatever. Um, but also there's some stuff, and this is, like, he has annotations because, like I said, he annotated this book to be like, here's what it's like writing a book, and here's what I was thinking about from chapter to chapter. Um... And one of the things he writes about is that he wrote this book when he was, like, in the process of getting, like, married and, like, getting more intimate with his wife. And, like, he was going through a lot of those emotions at the time. And, like, you can clearly feel that with, like, the romantic subplots of these books where they feel really legitimate and real and, like, really well-written, like, passages about, like, this is what it's like to finally find someone who, like, cares about you and, like, all that sort of stuff or whatever. But then it's also like, yeah, I, I don't think that this is what, like, a 14-year-old girl would be thinking the situation. That sounds like a dude wrote it. Um, it's fine. Uh, I, I haven't been reading it at the pace I've been reading Stormlight Archive just because it's very clearly uh, more unpolished work. Um, but I, I do want to get more into it. It's kind of nice, kind of going back to what you're saying, it's kind of nice reading something that's a little more politics and intrigue oriented than, like, Oh yeah, there's fight scenes all the fucking time, so. Yeah, especially in novels, fight scenes can really drag. Yeah, so there's there's a lot going on in that book. Honestly, I don't think I did a great I job summarizing. Yeah, it's it's complex. I think it's I think it's a very seven out of ten book, uh, and and I feel like that maybe is like oh no, you don't like it, but like. It's fine. It's just I I haven't found any character that I particularly really latch onto. Uh, well, maybe there's one character who's like he's one of the revived gods or whatever, but his thing is that he just doesn't believe that he doesn't believe the his own religion that he's a god of. Mm. So he just kind of treats it like shit. And also, like there's some really funny passages where like two of the gods will be hanging out and they're just obviously making like dick jokes and then it's like in the other room there's like 18 scholars furiously writing down everything that they're saying to study later like they just can't stop like living under scrutiny because everyone just treats them like they're gods and it's funny but yeah it's fine that, um it does remind me unless you had more to say on that I felt no like that i was i was out <laughs> i um I, I forgot to put this on the list, but I did. Uh, I have continued reading The Witcher. Oh yeah, because I was. Uh, it's, oh. it's it's funny. I, I took a year break. And I now I I'm have still... a thing to talk about tangentially with that that will tie The Witcher and Brandon Sanderson's works together. But c please continue. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not gonna go on about The Witcher. Just uh, I've read now the fourth book overall and the second book of the novel series which mm -hmm. is uh the time of contempt um i don't know if anyone would remember i don't expect you to i was kind of a little lukewarm on uh the blood of elves or whatever it was called the f the first novel third book yeah uh, i like i liked this one more this one was definitely more interesting but i still think that um 
this guy was definitely a lot better at writing short stories than novels. His pacing is really off. Mm. And I think that's the biggest. And it, it, it's it's a lot better in this one, but only because all of the characters are finally together in this one. So there's a lot more going on in that respect. But uh, yeah, he, he's... These novels are weirdly paced where it almost felt like nothing happened in the first one. And in this second one, it feels like we're looking at like the beginning of something. Oh. So yeah, it's, it's weirdly paced, but I am enjoying it more now than I was a year ago. <laughs> okay. I, I got shit. They'll tie this all together. Um, so I've been doing this thing as of late where like, I kind of, if I've been doing this natural discovery of fiction thing that I've been kind of testing out a little bit, that's been kind of working for me where like, if I randomly just suddenly hear about a thing in, like, numerous places from, like, things that I otherwise enjoy, like, oh, hey, this YouTuber passively referenced, like, a movie, and then I'm listening to a podcast, and from, like, completely different people, they also reference this movie. I, like, just make note of it, like, maybe maybe, I, maybe this is a fun way to discover things. Um, and one thing I've been... Uh, one thing that I found recently that I've kind of always known existed but never really cared to look into... Uh, was the works of fantasy author Michael Moorcock, uh, most famously probably known at this point for his Elric saga. Zach, do you know about these at all? Nope. Okay, so Michael Moorcock is a guy who was very foundational to, like, 19... I want to say, like, 1950s, 1960s, like, even into the 70s and 80s, and he's still alive and making shit today, fantasy liter literature. But he's one of those people that, like... Within the genre, well-known and respected, he influenced a bunch of stuff. Nobody in the fucking mainstream popular culture knows who this guy is. Um, and I've always just kind of known of him. Uh, he actually exists in a very interesting time in the literature world between, like, Tolkien and, like, Stephen King. Or, or like, maybe not Stephen King, he's more contemporary with him, I guess. But, like, he, he is a bridge between the old and newer type stuff. Yeah. Um, and he's actually a very interesting person because a lot of his work is very reactionary to stuff around him at the time. Um, so one thing that I find really interesting is um, he actually, as a teenager, like met and befriended Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, and he did not like their work at all. Hmm. Um, and he, and like he was like, I think they were lovely people, but like I don't like the Christianity thing of the Narnia books and the other C.S. Lewis stuff. And I don't. I really don't like the idea of Tolkien. That like, I I guess his thing with Tolkien was because he was also like English, and Tolkien's works are very celebratory of English folklore and like fairy tales and stuff. Yeah. And he, his thing was part of that was, hey, I don't like that we're looking that far in the past. There's a lot of really gross stuff in there that I think we should frankly leave behind. And also, he really didn't like the oh the the good king the people with the royal blood are going to be here to save us thing. He he <laughs> he did not like that because he was like, that's not how that went at all. Uh, to be fair, to Tolkien wasn't entirely that either. The whole point of Tolkien was that the savior was some random hobbit. Yes, true. But the way people talk about Aragorn in that book, at the very yeah, least... Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I would say... I get why he sat, he saw yeah. that, but I would say that that's unfair to Tolkien's work. Yeah. Um, the other things that he's known for is he really didn't like H.P. Lovecraft for obvious reasons. I get, can't imagine why. <laughs> um, and Did he, you see H. Bomb's new video? <laughs> yeah, it was a good video, by the way. Uh, man, yeah. no, I never thought I'd see anyone talk about that Cthulhu movie. I felt like I was the only person who's ever seen that. Um, <laughs> interesting movie. Um... Okay, everyone check out H-Bomber Guy. He's good. He's really good. Um, but he also had a really big problem with Conan the Barbarian. Because okay. he was like, this is fucking shit literature, and I, fuck the macho man archetype gets the girl thing. He, this dude was very anti authority You could probably get just from, like, the problems he has with his contemporaries, like... Where he stands societally, politically, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so a lot of his work was... Another SJW. <laughs> a little bit. Um, <laughs> he was... <laughs> the theme of this episode. Yes. I'm back, guys! Oh, uh, no. <laughs> Notorious anti-SJW. <laughs> no, he was, he was a very progressive, forward-thinking person. 
Um, so he, his thing was he wanted to write fantasy that was more for him or like his sensibilities. And he's like, I, I don't want to portray the upper class as heroic. I want to portray them what my experience with them has been like. Um, so he wrote this series of short stories that then got expanded into novels about a long white haired man who went around solving supernatural problems. Um, sound a little bit familiar? <laughs> Just off concept a little bit? Long, white-haired man. The Witcher. Oh. Um, so the thing about this is he wrote- I thought you were going to say Doctor Who. Oh, yeah. Hey, guess what? Sorry, sorry. No. Juliet asked me to bring up Doctor Who. So. It's fine. Hey, guess what? He has a connection to Doctor Who. And I'll, I will tell you that, to, I will also tell you that because it's one of the few Doctor Who things I love and it's hilarious. Well, I, I know and it's hilarious, rather. I've, I've never read the work. Um, so. It's the looms, man. Oof, I'll, I'll let you know. It's a, it's a very non-canon Doctor Who thing <laughs> for a good reason. Oh god, is he the looms, man? Alright, go ahead. I, I don't know what that is, but. Go ahead. Um, so he wrote this series about an anemic prince named Elric. I think he's a prince, he might be a king. Uh, who finds a cursed black blade called Stormbringer. Uh, Stormbringer is a completely black sword that is sentient and has this, I believe, has the soul of the demon Ariosh inside of it. Which, you know, that demon appears in a lot of things. Um, and it's one of the big, like, first popular culture things where that name really appears. Uh, and basically the, the, the gimmick of the sword is that if it slashes you, it just steals your soul. And then like the demon inside eats the soul, like it'll just kill you right away. Uh, this sword has been referenced in fucking everything. Uh, the fucking demon soul sword is a shout out to it of all things, even though it doesn't work the same. Like there's some like weird, like connection stuff where like, they're like, yeah, we, we kind of got that from the Elric thing or whatever. Um, Black Razor from D and D used to actually just be called Stormbringer, and they legally had to change it. Um, and also, this one of his big things that he was known for, which I think will resonate with our audience, is he was like, "I don't like that fantasy so far has been about good versus evil because the world doesn't work that way." So he decided to make his about law versus chaos. Yeah! Now, to the point where if you Wikipedia search the phrase law and chaos, it refers to the concept as discussed in the Michael Moorcock universe. Oh, damn. Um, and that's where D&D &D got the nine alignment thing from. And as a result, that's where SMT got the law versus chaos. Yeah, yeah. Um... So, oh, I'm interested now. Yeah. Um, and like, so you think Elric being like a prince would be like, oh yeah, law. No, he's super chaotic. Um, and apparently the, the entire collection of short stories and novels is about him basically like his life going to shit. The fact that he has this cursed blade, like constantly ruining his life. And like every time he tries to solve a problem, he just makes it worse sort of thing. And then I think he just dies at the end or whatever. Um, it's like a very tragic, episodic story. Um, and he, he ended up at some point or another working all of his fiction into one monomyth that he made himself where every main character, love interest, and villain of his, uh, novels, or like any story he ever writes, are actually reincarnations of the same entities, but different takes on the entities. And sometimes there's hints that, like... Maybe subconsciously this reincarnation remembers some past experiences and, like, becomes a better person or a more effective villain or hero because of it. Mm. Um, like, it's not, like, they're not all connected, but there's a sense of continuity, it seems like. I Once again, I've not read any of the man's work, but it seems interesting. Uh, but apparently, also, he does have a problem with, like, some of his stories have very clear deus ex, ex machinas and, like... Sometimes it seems like he's kind of struggling to hit a deadline because he also comes from that time where it's like, yeah, I'm getting paid to write and we don't make a lot. So when the book needs to be done, it's done, you know, <laughs> you know. Um, so I, I, I do have a collection of the first series of Elric stories and I do want to get past it or I get through it at some point. 
And also that, that cursed sword from that Brandon Sanderson book I was talking about is clearly a shout out to Stormbringer. Like it, it basically works the exact same minus like the soul taking part, but like evil dark sword or whatever. Um, I want to say there's like another thing that is like a very clear shout out to it. That is like from a JRPG or something, but I can't think of it off the top of my head, but he's influential. Now, the one thing though about this guy, so the Witcher books start to get a little popular after a point with the whole video games things coming in. Yeah. Michael Moorcock starts to look at these, and he's like, this seems cool. <laughs> then after a bit, he goes, huh. You know, there's a lot of similarities here. And apparently he wrote to the author of The Witcher, and the author of The Witcher wrote back, like, fuck off, never talk to me again. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like him. So that's the thing. Between this and that one, like, Metro 2033 article with that one dude, like, the, the dude of the dude who writes The Witcher just comes off as, like, the just, like, saltiest old grandpa. <laughs> like, it's so funny. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, I don't know. He He's one of those dudes who, like, I'm, I think I'm gonna feel bad because, like, Harlan Ellison, he's gonna die and, like... Just now, people are starting to realize, oh, Harlan Ellison wrote these episodes of, like, this episode of Star Trek that, like, is really famous, and he, he he was responsible for this, this, and that. And, like, it's just one of those, like, people that just, like, were born almost too early for their own good, where it's, like, it's hard to get people caring about fantasy shit in, like, the 70s or whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, And only the people who really know the shit, like, enjoy that stuff. Um, so I, I kind of want to give his stuff a go because it seems really up my alley. And not going to lie, I'm very curious to see... Because, like, these days having a fantasy book where, like, oh, it's gray morality, like, that's a fucking... Get, like, that's the standard at this point, right? Yeah. I'm really curious to see what a book written in the 1960s, th like, thinks that, like, gray morality is like, you know? Because it's going to look different than how we look at it. Um, so, yeah. Uh, seems like a cool thing that I'm gonna probably get started on next WAF. I'll read the first bunch of Elric books. Oh, also to ignore the Amazon reviews because, um, as any collection I feel should, the, um, publisher, or the, the people who have the rights to at least his Elric stuff decided we're gonna release the entirety of the Elric series in six books. Six collections. So as you think would be understood as the thing to do, they released it in publication order, not chronological order. And there's a bunch of people that are really mad about this. They're like, what the fuck? Well, how come I get the origin story in, like, the third book? And it's like, that's because that's when it was written. Um, but yeah, other than that. No, that's so just... Doctor Who. Oh, yes, okay. So, apparently at some point, and this, this is just a vague thing I know about. He wrote a Doctor Who story at some point. Apparently he's, like, a fan, but also, like, he got hired on to do it or whatever. And he wrote a story and, like, tied in his, like, reincarnation thing into Doctor Who to, like, hint that, oh, Doctor Who is actually one of the incarnations of this entity from all my other works, thus linking the <laughs> series together. And apparently Doctor Who fans went livid and sent him, like, death threats and shit. Like, I mean, yeah, that sounds pretty stupid. And, like, it doesn't yeah. match with Doctor Who. <laughs> and apparently that thing just, like, super non-canon. No one gives a fuck about it or whatever anymore. But, yeah, like, yeah. I just love the idea that he was like, hell yeah, I'm gonna do this. And people just got so mad about <laughs> it. Um, yeah. Interesting fellow, interesting fellow. I'm trying to read more older stuff, too. Like, I want to go back and read more of that Harlan Ellison stuff, because I didn't... I, I mean, every... I feel like a lot of people have read I know, I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream, but, like... Yeah. The man wrote a lot of shit, and it's good. No, that's it. That's the only thing he's ever written. <laughs> only thing he ever written. The PC game only. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. You know the stories about him working with people on that, right? I've heard tales. <laughs> it's a fucking... Uh, what, a, what a character. What a card. <sighs> yeah. Old literature. <laughs> Who reads books anymore? Not me. Yeah, why read... I only, I only consume new media. Yeah. Speaking of old <laughs> media... <laughs> I... I've, uh... I've, like I said, been on a pulpy kick as of late. So, uh... Seven Seas Entertainment are the folks that brought over that Devil Man stuff. 
uh, which also I think I've said already, but it includes like a side material thing, just kind of duct taped in there too. So they've been bringing over a lot of stuff, actually. Seven Seas is probably one of the cooler, like, niche manga publishers out right now. Uh, they actually had a really cool thing that um, happened uh, last month um, for Pride Month. They just, like, every day they were announcing, hey, we're bringing over, the, like, this LGBTQ Pride manga. And, like, they're straight up like, we know this isn't going to be our most profitable stuff, but we feel like this is an important part of Japanese culture that we should share with America and stuff like that. And it's like, that's cool. Um, so, like, really positive vibes from that company all around. I'm like, hell yeah, that's awesome. Uh, they also, in general, are just bringing over a bunch of niche shit that is old and, like, five people care about. Um, I think they actually got the right to Devilman stuff before Crybaby dropped, and that just happened to be a happy coincidence for them, it sounds like. Um, but one thing that caught my eye, just like from Amazon suggested, like, hey, you pre-ordered Devilman, what about this? Um, also by Seven Seas Entertainment. They're bringing over the works of Leiji Matsumoto. Uh, Zach, have you ever heard of Space Battleship Yamato? Heard of it. Yes, so I also had just heard of it, Knew it was a sci-fi thing. Never cared anything else about it. Um, turns out actually kind of influential because it was, fun fact, the first dubbed anime. Oh. F first thing from Japan, like, TV-wise, to actually get shown uh, in, like, American broadcast or whatever way back in the day. Like, obviously, they like, changed the fuck out of it because <laughs> that's how they did it back then. But, um, it, yeah, it was brought over as, like, Star Blazers or something. Um... But yeah, also apparently had, I think, I think I've read somewhere that like it had some influence, like George Lucas was a fan of the series or something too, like it's one of those things or whatever. Um, but Leiji Matsumoto uh, wrote that, uh, and that's probably the thing he's best known for. Uh, and apparently there's kind of a, so you know that thing with the Batman creation rights where like there was a guy who made Batman and then there was the guy who made everything else you know about Batman? But people, yeah. yeah, but people only credit the first guy. Apparently that's actually kind of a space battleship thing where someone else created the premise and the name of the thing, and then he made everything that people liked about the book and show. Um, and that led to, like, rights issues and shit in, like, the 2000s that led to complications. Um, but he also wrote uh, Galaxy Express 999, which I know is, like, a beloved thing by a bunch of people. I've... I barely had heard of it before. Um, at some point, I think I'll check it out. Uh, and he's also written this other thing called Captain Harlock, uh, which previously I had only known about because scrolling through Netflix, you'd run into the CGI weird-looking movie called Harlock. And I was like, I don't know what the fuck that is, but it looks dumb, and I'd scroll past it. It's actually a movie CGI adaptation of this material. Um... And apparently, fun fact, all of his stories take place in, like, a shared continuity thing, but, like, they don't, like, nothing really lines up. It's just like, oh, the character from the one book will show up in this book, and, like, nothing actually really, like, lines up or matters. It's just a fun thing he liked to do. Um, so Captain Harlock takes place in an Earth where, and they, they say this, they say this over and over again. It is the future, and it's Earth, and people on Earth no longer dream they no longer dream about anything, and they don't have any goals, and they're really lazy. It's kind of like a serious Wally -E situation. <laughs> um, and Captain Harlock has a, a space pirate ship thing that's really awesome and has a giant skull and crossbones on the side. And he's, he's, he's fed up with the Earth people. He's going to live the life in, in space. And anyone who is a crew member gets to live a free life. That's they're gonna have dreams and they're gonna have goals in life and they're gonna they're gonna live freely and not feel like the man is holding them down. Um, and he goes. He's kind of a asshole, but he also saves people. And at the end of the, he's he's Han Solo. He always does the right thing in the end, but he might be grumpy about it or whatever. Um. But so he shot first. Oh man, Oof, there's some there's some shooting first that happens in this series. Oh. So the first thing that I was surprised by is that the main character of the book Captain Harlock Space Pirate is not act not actually Captain Harlock. Actually a little bit of a Frodo thing going on, where you see Captain Harlock through the real main character, who is a lot more wimpy and not very good at what he does. Mm. So there's a there's a kid named Tadashi, and he's like a I think he's like a 17-year-old kid. 
uh, and his dad is a scientist for the Earth government, which is basically... It, it seems like it's like, oh, the Earth Federation equivalent of this world is just like Japan's Japan's government is just the Earth government now. Um, and the Prime Minister is like a comical, useless figure that like every time that any... You know the Shin Godzilla thing where it's like nothing gets done because they're like, oh, we have we have to have a meeting about this. Or, oh, I don't really think that it's my job. I think it's this other guy's, like, the bureaucracy thing. Yeah, that's sick social commentary. Yeah, they do that a lot in this book. Um, or, like, to, to a degree that, like, it's so clearly meant to be, com- like, comedy, but, like, it just gets too ridiculous and goofy. And I'm sure that, like, in the 60s or whenever the fuck this was written, it was a lot edgier. Um, but, like, it gets really stupid. Uh, but anyways, so Tadashi's dad is the scientist that works for the government, and his dad's really fed up with the government, because, uh, when, when, (laughs) when Tadashi mom, Tadashi's dad's wife, (laughs) this is my new naming convention for mom Mm -hmm. characters, uh, anyways, when, when Tadashi's mom went on, she was also a scientist, she went to, like, research the atmosphere of like pluto and like her ship blew up and like no one claimed responsibility and it was one of the it was like a it was like a legal investigation that fell through the cracks because no one gave a shit and no one wanted to be held responsible for fucking up so they've been pissed off at the earth government but they like they kind of feel like we have to work for them they're the government sort of thing um one day, a giant black sphere falls from the sky into the middle of, like, some random city that hasn't been named yet. And it has, like, hieroglyphs on it. And the government doesn't want to do anything about it. And the scientist man is like, this is clearly from an advanced alien species that's going to come here to fuck us up. And, and the fucking prime minister says the line, and I quote, Let's just pretend that it's a mountain that we didn't notice before. <laughs> and also he's really upset because the black sphere crushed his golf course um and the government doesn't care about the sphere until it starts to emit fog because the fog is violating the citizens right to sunshine and then they go ah oh, jesus christ this is gonna be a fuck we're gonna have to hold a bunch of meetings do a bunch of paperwork to fucking figure this out um anyways early on while tadashi's dad is studying this uh, a woman in a black cloak breaks into his lab and just fucking shoots him and tries to strangle Tadashi. And then a pirate shows up and shoots the woman, and the woman just burns alive. And the guy goes, hi, I'm Captain Harlock. If you want to learn the secret of the women who burn like paper, come to my ship at 3 p.m. And then he walks away. And the kid goes, what the fuck? And then he gets roped into wacky pirate adventures, and they have to save Earth from the invading space of women who burn like paper. And they 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 always refer to them as the women who burn like paper <laughs> until they finally get a name, which is Mazan, which is just Amazon without the A. <laughs> yeah, it's dumb. <laughs> But just, like, it's great because there's, like, spaceship fight scenes and they're being tailed by, like, an enemy spaceship and he'll just go, is is this one of the women who burn, like, paper? And it's like, do we have to call them that every time? <laughs> um, yeah. And, like, there's some fun stuff where, like, he first is like, all right, these these guys are probably, like, really hardcore, like, pirate types. And then he gets onto the ship and, like, there's just, like, beer and, like, pizza boxes and like board games strewn out about the place there's a dude who constantly is in the bathtub making model boats and shit and like captain harlock's thing is like yeah like this is your home now and like you want to do fun stuff and just hang out and be with your friends and people you love at home so like we don't care how serious you are until a battle happens other than that feel free to live your life however you want uh and also if at any point you ideologically disagree with me just feel free to leave i don't care like, he just has this open ship for people that just want to live a free life. And if at any point you're like, man, fuck you guys. He's like, yeah, you can just leave. It's fine. <laughs> like, it's a really interesting premise. And, like, you get to learn more about this, like, hardcore, like, kind of douchebag, but also deep down in his heart wants to be a good guy, space pirate guy. There's a really good point where, like, Tadashi's explaining his tragic backstory to the crew where he's like, yeah, like, they just, they basically are responsible for the death of my mom and never owed up to it. 
and like he has a moment where he's like, man, I know that we have to save Earth from these women who burn like paper, but I almost wonder if I'd be happier if we just blew up Earth right now. And I feel like that would be the point where Harlock would, or like in any other thing, like the main, like, pirate dude would be like, that's nonsense, you need to grow up, kid, or whatever. And instead he just goes, yeah, sometimes I feel that way myself. And, like, they, <laughs> and, like they just move on and act like that was nothing. <laughs> um, it's really corny 60s sci-fi fun, and I like it a lot. Um, it's being split into three volumes, and I have to say this first volume is not as large as the Devilman one, so I'm kind of almost wondering if maybe they could have done two and maybe they're milking it a little bit, but also I don't want to make that judgment until I have the other two in my hands. Um, but yeah, Captain Harlock as a figure has apparently just been, like, one of that dude's big uh, figures, and, like, there's a bunch of different, like, shows and, like, mangas and different like different takes on the character like he's he's a little bit of like a pulp icon thing um for that guy and he's just he's gotten shows up until like i think the early 2000s there was like a 12 episode ova um i've i have all of those now like i i am just invested in this character <laughs> um so yeah it's fun there's also a really like gundam like original gundam style tv show that was made for it which apparently adapts the manga rather well and like has the same animation foibles where sometimes ships just look dumb. <laughs> um, and I want to watch that at some point. Apparently it's all on Crunchyroll for free. So yeah. Pulp. Other than that, time to talk about modern comic books now. <laughs> Zach, do you know who Rick Remender is? Uh, not by name, at least. Uh, okay, I'm gonna read, so you probably recognize these names better than I do. Um, he's mm. a comic book icon dude, apparently he's been around for a while and writ some, wrote some stuff. Um, oh, well, I have the book, I'm going to the back. Uh, he wrote, uh, Low, Fear Agent, Deadly Class, Tokyo Ghost, Black Science, um... Uncanny Avengers, Captain America, Uncanny X-Force, and Venom. I don't know if you recognize any of those. Yeah, I know, I know some of those names. Okay, um, but the reason I know him is he has also <laughs> written for b video games such as Bulletstorm and Dead Space 1. Okay. Um, so, you know, may maybe not Bulletstorm, but Dead Space 1, definitely a well-written thing. Um... I had a friend who just sincerely, like, was like, hey, I want you to read this. Like, you would like this. Like, one of those very, very targeted, like, someone knows my sensibilities and knows I would like a thing thing. Yeah. And I was like, eh, it's only ten bucks. And, it like, they're being released in, like, these, like, time. I don't know how big normal trades are, but, like, they're being released in these, like trades that collect about four issues at a time i don't know if that's like a standard size or if that's kind of small um but i mean they're cheap like i think they're only like 10 bucks a pop or whatever which ain't the worst yeah. um so i picked up the first one of these um this might be one of my favorite fantasy stories ever and i'm only four issues in hmm. um this is just really well written um and you know me, I am, you know me, I, I hate the whole, like, oh, let's do shitty real-life political allegory by, like, saying, like, I hate the shit where it's like, ah, Trump is Voldemort thing, where it's like, th that is not good criticism. Like, that's just the most baby, like, put A and B together and f act like we're actually saying something, but, like, there's no meaningful criticism there. Like, actually call out the bad shit he's doing. Like, don't just slap, like, a fictional character onto him or whatever this is the best fantasy critique of trump i could have ever asked for the antagonist is the is just trump and this was written during the election <laughs> cycle and oh. it is incredible um so the main premise of this book is that there is a it takes place in a dark fantasy world that seemed it seemed like there used to be better days um but there's the spe I think they're like a species of people called the Mozak. I don't exactly know what the Mozak are, but everyone who has appeared uh, and have called themselves a Mozak, uh, 
they come in different races. And, like, you got your traditional, like, goblins, elves, and orcs and all that shit going on. Um, these people called Mozak just appear, and they have, like, magical powers. Like, basically, like, you know, like, traditional wizard shit and, like, some that are more, like, super powery or whatever. Um... And one of them is this guy known as uh, the Mud King. He has, like, some other, like, garbly, like, name that's, like, oh, you tried really hard to make a fantasy, like, evil name that I can't remember for the life of me because it's kind of bad. But it, it doesn't matter because everyone calls him either the Mud King or the God of Whispers. Um, and he's maybe one of, like, the most interesting premises for a villain I've heard in a while. Uh, and it hits a little close to home. So his thing is that he himself is powerful but not like only to a point uh he is made entirely out of mud um and his power is that he can make a deal with you and if you accept the deal he will deliver on his promise to the best of his capability but for the rest of your life he can see and hear through your eyes and ears and eventually through like decades of doing this with people about half the population of the pla like the society they're in have just agreed to like agreed to a deal with this guy. So by default he has become like a tyrant leader just by proxy of like hey, I I can hear and see anything at any point and I have a bunch of devout followers that like if I see that you're trying to act against me, I will sick them on you and they will just lynch you. Um and any society or group of people that try to not, like, try to resist this at all, um, he finds ways to, like, infiltrate rumors and doubt and, like, racism and xenophobia and, like, paranoia into those communities until they tear each other apart. Uh, I'm gonna read a fucking excerpt right here because this is, like, the most, oh, Jesus Christ, this was written about Trump thing I've read ever. Um... <laughs> let's see uh, we spent the following weeks anticipating an invasion but no army ever came but a vir virulent plague soon struck our city followed by swarms of locusts which destroyed our crops and unseen forces began killing off the livestock within weeks the food was depleted there was no work to be had the sick were dying on the streets starving and desperate then the whispers began to spread the lies, the hate regular men who'd become suddenly wealthy began holding public assemblies, voicing er, selling themselves as the common voice. They gave validation to the people's darkest subconscious fears and secret prejudices by blaming all misfortunes on minorities. They, conv they convinced the native families that their woes came on the backs of spies hidden amongst the refugees. Prejudice and xenophobia became accepted as normal, as true. As a bit on the nose. <laughs> it is, but also it's it's then followed up by this elven woman's backstory about how when the armies did finally come, her f family was ripped apart before her eyes, and she was ripped apart with her with them, and then she learned in the burning pile of bodies what her secret magical power is, that she can take other people's flesh and meld it to her body, and her. <sighs> Her entire character is not her. It's the patchwork pieces of her dead family. And Fuck. she really fucking hates the Mud King. <laughs> um, it's really dark. It's not afraid to go places. Um, you don't say! Yeah. Um, the main character is interesting because they li they're, they're basically... They live on the fringe of society because the Mud King... So this one dude who was like a contemporary with the Mud King... Um, like, he, he, they studied together or whatever. He started to see what he was doing, and he's like, what the fuck? And the Mud King was like, hey, dude, let's make a deal. And he's like, no, I'm not gonna be a tool for you to use. Um, so eventually he frames it so that this guy, it looks like this guy killed, like, a really important priest. And, like, he just gets outcasted by society. So he takes his family, and he moves kind of to the outskirts in this, like, mountainous valley region and they they just live as hermits on the edge of society and it seems like there's a there's a few more people that live there because the story isn't about him the story actually starts with the mud king attacking their village and him dying uh it actually t uh takes on his son as the main character um and he 
he basically had to grow up living on the edge of society, not understanding why everyone hates them. And, like, just over time, slowly starting to realize, like, oh, this is what my dad did, and, like, this is why society hates us, and that's not fair. Uh, but also kind of being sick of it and, like, hey, I want to be accepted. Like, whatever my dad did, I don't have to own up to that or whatever. Like, that's not fair. Um, so his dad gets killed in an attack. Um, and I think some time passes, but basically he's dying. And after his dad died, he's, he's kind of the only one that's like left to take care of the rest of the family. And also he's, he's married to someone like they have kids. Um, and, and he's just like, there, there are just panels of him coughing up blood. Like he has some type of play going on. So his his thing is like, well, my dad always told me never hear out the Mud King's offer, and that like that's kind of the fucking, um, my father's house of this book to bring it back to Long Halloween, like always like people asking, did you hear his offer or like never hear out his offer is just the recurring like words of the, this book. Yeah. Um. So his dad is just constantly like never ever ever hear this guy out. He like just stay stay the fuck away. Um, but he eventually reaches a point where he says, you know what? I'm going to die in a couple of weeks because I'm just sick. Why don't I go over and I make a deal with him and I say, hey, I'll let you take over my body and I'll be a servant of you as long as what I want is I want my family and all of the people over there to just never be bothered by you and your forces ever again. Seems like a worthy trade. Like he's going to die anyways. Who the fuck gives a shit? So he gets over there, and he presents this to the Mud King, and the Mud King says, oh, I can make you better. And he's kind of like, shit. (laughs) 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 Um, And while he's struggling with what the fuck do I say to that, seven people, actually, I think it's more like eight people break in, um, and they have an owl that allows the Mud King's power to be canceled out. So the hive, he's disattached from the hive mind, and that, like, fucks with him. And, and, like, there's actually, like, a really great, like, line where he says something like, my eyes and ears are gone, or, like, like oh, no, I'm normal again, or something like that. Um, and they kill all of his forces, and they kidnap him. And the, the main character guy, his name is Adam, I'll just call him Adam, says, okay, let's kill him. But you can't, because if you kill him... Everyone who's linked to him also dies. So they have to go across the country to find a specific wizard who can undo the hive mind, and then they can kill him. And there's a lot of interesting conversations about who's to say it wouldn't be better if all those people died. And there's some really tough conversations to be had there of like, Hey, yeah, I I really don't care if the people who treated my family like shit and like lynched like attempted to kill us for decades like, actually dies. And then there's conversation of like they were misled, they were lied to, they gave into their fear and they're shitty people. But like, we should think about this with nuance. And like, there's a bunch of like really like oh fuck what the fuck do we do about this sort of thing? And there's also people who like seem to be stuck into like. Hey, I was raised in the society where I have to take a deal with this guy or else he's going to murder my family. And like there are people who are connected to him against their will because the, literally they their family will just be murdered if they don't agree to take the deal with him. So like it gets really messy. Um there's an issue where the Mud King is just constantly making fun of people trying to get them to kill him. Um there's also a character who they just constantly call Goblin, who's like a shapeshifter. And like eventually the main character's like, do we have to call him Goblin? Like that's kinda like that's kind of shitty and racist. And then the goblin goes, No, they don't call me Goblin because like it's a sh- like they're like that's what I'm known for. They're calling me Goblin because I'm literally the only goblin left alive because the Mud King killed every all all of the other goblins. <laughs> um yeah, it's um it's drawn really beautifully too. Uh I was kind of taken aback by like how legitimate of like political like progressive commentary this was 
where it was just like, yeah, how do we deal with the society that has gone to this breaking of a point? And how do we fight back against someone who can, who does such a great job of spreading paranoia and fear? And it's called Seven to Eternity because, um, like, the seven of them, I think including the Mud King, have to, like, go across the country to find, you know, the wizard guy. Uh, I highly recommend it. It seems to be kind of a smaller thing. It doesn't seem super popular, but it's. I was blown away by it. Um, a second volume is out, which I, I, I should order at some point, because I finished this just the other day. And I think a third volume is coming out in, like, November, and I think that f is, like, the end of the story. So... Mm. Okay. Yeah. Um, it... Oh, also, like, there's just, like, really good writing. Like, there... Like, the, um... Like, at, at some point, there's, like, a godlike entity talking to the, um, elf, like, the elf lady who's, like, made up of her family members. And, and like, he calls her, like, wielder of the meat shells or something like that. Like, <laughs> it's dumb, but I love it a lot. Yeah. I, I, not gonna lie, I, I... I've been in a fantasy mood, and I, I, I'm just happy to have a fantasy thing that is, like willing to dive into the shit and take a very hard this is something we have to fight back against stance. <laughs> yeah. Take it a little bit deeper than the elves or minorities. Yeah. Um and actually that seems to be the thing that like is interesting me the most because it seems like the race stuff isn't actually the thing. It's like, hey, like, are you a magic user or not? Or like what religion do you do you belong to or like what part of this kingdom do you come from? Like they they do it better than just, oh, the orcs don't like the elves. Uh, yeah. Which I appreciate always when they do that. So, yeah, that, that's been a thing. I will report back on, in on that because I've been enjoying the fuck out of it. Um, and and it, then one day you'll play Dragon Age. <laughs> yeah, I will. One day. One day I'll play Dragon Age. Woo! Well. Waff. Snappy and to the point, phase two. <laughs> Three hours, 25 minutes. Aw, oh, yeah. Good. What you... <laughs> hey, write in the comments what you guys think about phase two. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'm using the DMC5 logo from now on. I've just decided uh, yeah. that I've just decided we're going to, our logo is going to be whatever the current Devil May Cry logo is. Hey, oh. that's that's fine. I like the DMZ5 logo better than the <laughs> WAF one, so... Watch, watch like, the fucking... Like, Devil May Cry 6 comes out as just, like, a fucking dick. <laughs> like... <laughs> Get all in! <laughs> We're just gonna regret this, like, five years nope. from now. Uh, no regrets. No regrets. We are finally penises. been a while is that our new intro theme <laughs> yeah shout outs to who fucking oh wait nickelback Sta no it's it's stained it's nickelback i i thought it was it, it's this here says it's stained is it stained yeah well it's been a while wait no, did they cover it i thought that was nickelback uh stained Really? That was stained? Yeah. Hold on. 
Fun fact, the uh, music video of which was directed by Fred Durst. Yeah, I guess it was stained, huh? Yeah. I, I mean, literally I... Googled, it's been a while, Nickelback, which was a Google Which, yeah, like, that's the thing. So, like, this is clearly, because I noticed that, too. It was a recommendation, but... <laughs> oh, well, it's fine. No, hold on, I gotta listen to this now. I I just like that their their um singles chronology uh between uh between home and outside is it's been a while. Yeah, it is stained. Damn, man. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> now that we <laughs> really... I thought it was Nickelback. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hey, to be fair, I didn't know offhand who the fuck it was. Uh, Honestly. The thing is, I remember Stained. Like, I remember them existing. I mean, I do, too. I never really listened to them, but it's fine. Mm, anyway. Uh, anyways. So now that we've alienated everyone born after the year 2000... <laughs> we can start again. <laughs> okay. <laughs>